The Valiant, Star Legend, Book One, written and narrated by J. J. Green. Chapter One. The distress signal was impossible, yet there it was, a flashing pinprick of red on the console screen, and steady beeps, three short, three long, three short, from the comm officer's headset. It was an ancient code. Yet the ship's computer had recognised it and flagged it for immediate attention. Major Wright gazed down at the enigmatic dot and passed the headset back to its owner. Where is it coming from? He asked again, leaning closer to peer at the mountainous topography of the region. Nantgar Igarth, Corporal Singh repeated patiently. West Britannic Isles, Nantgar. Where the hell's that? It looks like the arse end of nowhere. Why would we have anyone there? The corporal didn't answer. No doubt, guessing the question was rhetorical. I didn't know if I should alert the brigadier, sir. He said. Only, Singh didn't need to say any more. He hadn't wanted to wake Colburn in the middle of the quiet shift. Smart choice. Wright slammed one hand against the console and straightened up. A few of the officers on the Valiant's bridge looked his way. He remembered he was barefoot and wearing crumpled standard issue pajama bottoms. He began to fasten the uniform shirt he'd pulled on after Singh had combed him. Might be a covert mission, he murmured. Yes, but Singh ventured. What? West be I? I thought the place was entirely EAC now, along with the rest of the country. It is, replied Wright. Has been for a couple of years. The European democracy's epicentre, Berlin, had fallen to the Earth Awakening Crusade a decade previously, and the organisation had pushed steadily westward, breaking down civilization as it went, eventually occupying the entire Britannic Isles. Wright had fought in some of the battles for his homeland, earning promotions, scars, and memories he would never forget. But he added, "If they are covert operatives, why aren't they alerting Sis? Why send out a general distress?" He'd heard of resistance groups that were fighting on in some areas, but he couldn't see why any of them would broadcast a code that hadn't been used in centuries. The two men regarded the puzzling blip. Singh coughed. If it is a genuine distress signal, yes, yes, all right," said the major testily, tiredness making him irritable. "I don't need you to inform me of the urgency of the situation, Corporal." He loved his job, but a good night's sleep came a close second place in his heart. He rubbed his beard shadow and then tried absent-mindedly to smooth down the tuft of hair that stuck up from the crown of his head. He was unsuccessful, as always. "There's nothing for it," he said. "I'll have to tell the brigadier. Rather you than me, sir." Wright had failed to raise his superior officer via her earcom, and she had refused an implant. So he had no choice except to wake her in person. By the time he reached Colburn's quarters, he had finished fastening his shirt and had tucked it into his pajamas. He thumbed the door buzzer and leaned on the bulkhead, propped on his forearm as he waited for a response. When none came, he pressed again, long and hard. God damn it! Growled a voice over the intercom. Someone had better be dying. It's right, Mum. Something's come up that requires your immediate attention. The intercom was silent. Then, well, what kind of something? A distress call. Only, suddenly the cabin door slid back, and an older woman's bony head thrust through the gap. Her eyes were narrowed, angry, and piercing. Only what? Brigadier Colburn asked between clenched teeth. Wright knew he wasn't receiving the full potential force of her ire, 
that she tolerated him better than the others, yet he still took half a step backward before explaining about the incongruous signal. West B.I.? asked Colburn. What the? Scowling, she said. Hold on. She withdrew into the darkness of her quarters. Seconds later, she re-emerged, wrapping a grey bathrobe over her sleep suit. As she marched down the passageway, he kept pace by her side and laid out the details of the situation. Age and tiredness showed in the lines of the brigadier's face, and her white hair was cropped close to her scalp, making her head look positively skeletal. He always thought of her as an old war-horse who deserved to have been put out to pasture years ago. But she never spoke of retirement. Like him, service was in her blood and she would probably die with her boots on. When he'd finished updating her, the brigadier slipped in her earcom and began barking orders. One of the Valiant's companion corvettes, HMSS Daisy, was to be prepped for a mission. The BA's corvettes were their only warships capable of space-to-surface travel. Turning her head sharply toward the Major, Colburn said, I want you to assemble a rescue task force. After a beat, he asked, We're going in? Of course we're going in, the brigadier spat. Do you think we should leave them there? It's our distress code they're sending. Those are our people. The only problem is we don't have time to arrange a stealth op. We'll have to get in and out fast before the EAC have time to respond. But what if they aren't our people? It could be an EAC trap. Then it's a damned good one, Colburn replied. They must know we'd never abandon our own. The brigadier strode through the door to the bridge. Every back in the place became bolt upright and all eyes became intent on their screens. Sing, Colburn snapped as she sat down. Report on the origin site of the distress signal. Yes, Mum, it's called Nant Gar -e Garth. I don't give a shit what it's called. White's already told me it's in the back of beyond. I want to know terrain, population, latest intel, if we have any. You know what I need. Do I have to spell it out to you in words of one syllable? Yes, Mum. Sorry, Mum. I do have some information. His voice petered out under the intensity of her glare, and his Adam's apple bobbed as he swallowed. Damn it, man, speak! It's mountainous, Singh blurted. Highest elevation, 550 metres. Latest population estimate, as 0.3 people per hectare. No known military installations. Scan data doesn't indicate any evidence of armaments either. He rattled off the local temperature and weather conditions, which were wintry. I still haven't established contact with the signal originator. Better. Right, where are you with assembling the task force? Nearly there. I've picked 20 of the best from the platoon aboard the Daisy. Good. You're leading the mission? I was planning to. The brigadier's stern expression grew pensive, and she didn't answer immediately. The situation troubled Wright too. No one in the Britannic Alliance would send a distress call from enemy territory unless they were in imminent peril. Even then, they might choose to fight it out, rather than endanger the lives of their rescuers. This was going to be a high-risk expedition. They had almost no knowledge of what the rescue team might expect, and they would be under extreme time pressure. He waited for Colburn's decision. Briefly making eye contact with him, she gave him a curt nod, adding, I'll speak to Sis while you're en route and update you about anything pertinent. Her words weren't particularly reassuring. If the individuals requesting rescue did have something to do with the Secret Intelligence Service, that didn't mean Sis would tell them anything relevant or helpful. In Wright's experience, the government department frequently operated as if it were independent, with interests and aims wholly distinct from those of the Britannic Alliance. Yet, 
Despite his many reservations, at the end of the day, Colburn was right. If there was a chance it was the BA's people calling for help, they could not ignore them. I'll head over to the Daisy, he said. Colburn turned to speak to Sing again. Chapter 2 The game of Shang-Chi wasn't going well for Tail and Ellis. It was her turn, and she'd been trying to figure out her next move for the last five minutes, but she couldn't see a way to reverse the tide of battle. The enemy general was well beyond her reach, while her own was trapped in one corner of the board, harried by soldiers, chariots and cannon. She looked up into the face of her friend, Amika Abacha, knowing she would find no mercy there. He gazed back, amusement twinkling in his dark blue eyes. Take all the time you need, little chick, he said expansively, his voice not much more than a soft rumble among the snores of their fellow Royal Marines in the ten-rack cabin. She'd never understood why he'd given her that nickname. She was far from little, and her days of being a chick were long gone. A butcher was the only person Talon would allow to call her that, and he knew it. At times like these, he took full advantage of the concession. Strike that. She did know why he used the nickname. It was to rile her, and he was doing a good job of it. She screwed up her face in frustration. A butcher's grin grew wider. Wearing only undershirts and shorts, they crouched over a small table set against the bulkhead farthest from the cabin door. A single overhead lamp spilled its light over the table and aged board game. The lines of the game were nearly worn away and the plastic pieces were barely identifiable anymore. But the game was the only thing the two insomniacs had to occupy them after lights out when all electronics were banned. Talon reached towards one of her advisor tiles. A batcher's eyebrows rose. She hesitated, her hand suspended over the tile before she dropped it to her side again and scowled. Her friend leaned over the table and gave her shoulder a friendly slap, nearly knocking her from her seat. Concede defeat. There's no shame in it. It's only a game. Besides, he stretched his long arms wide. It's late and I'm sleepy. Talon's scowl deepened and she studied the positions of the tiles on the board more closely. There had to be a way out of her predicament, if only she could see it. The figure of her friend suddenly stiffened and Talon, sensing the change in him, looked up. What's wrong? You don't hear it? he asked. She concentrated on the sounds around her. Aside from the noises of slumber from the other marines, all she could hear was the hum of the daisy's engines. Then she realised what a batcher meant. The engine noise had risen in pitch. They were no longer maintaining orbit, flanking the Valiant. They were on the move. Her stomach registered the new direction. The corvette was descending, which could only mean she was on her way to the surface. A quiet excitement rose in Talon. We're going down, she whispered. Aha, uh -huh, replied the batcher, but his look of delight as he'd anticipated beating her at Shang-Chi had faded. Now he looked sad. She wondered what was bothering him, but then she felt the beads of her necklace under her fingertips. When she'd realised they were going to earth, her hand had unconsciously strayed to the child's jewellery she always wore around her neck. She snatched her fingers away and looked down, embarrassed. A batcher was silent, and the cabin remained quiet, the sleeping marines unaware of the changing circumstances. Talon raised her gaze to her friend and saw he was touching the side of his head, listening to a comm. Every marine had an implant surgically installed just behind their left ears. When you were given an order, there was no avoiding it whether you were asleep or awake. If the device sensed you were sleeping, it would break into your dreams with an alarm that wouldn't turn off until you were conscious. The con would repeat until you gave the mental response you'd received it. A batcher's eyes refocused as the message ended. 
Grunts, groans and the rustle of sheets came from the racks as the marines began to stir. A batcher got up and went to step away from the table, but then he halted. You didn't hear it? Nope, replied Talon. What's happening? Rescue mission. Gotta attend a briefing. Hmm. Looks like I'm not invited. Looks like it. A batcher began to leave, but Talon grabbed his wrist. Rescue mission on the surface? Wright didn't say, but I guess so. That's where we're headed. If they're sending a corvette down, it must be somewhere dangerous. Did he say where it is exactly? No, he didn't. Overhead lights came to life. Three or four grumbling marines dropped from their upper racks to the floor and hastily pulled on their uniforms. The sleepers who hadn't been called to the briefing groaned and pulled their blankets over their heads. Talon hadn't released a batcher's wrist. She was thinking, Hey, I have to go, said her friend. How about, she hesitated, Want to swap places with me? He sighed. You know I can't do that. Wright ordered me on the mission, not you. I'll say you're sick and I'm taking your place. I haven't been to sick bay. If he checks out your story and finds out we both lied, I'll be in a world of trouble. I'll tell him. As soon as you woke, you threw up or something. Come on, do this for me. How often do we go to the surface these days? This might be the last chance I get. You don't even know where we're going. I know we were above Europe. That doesn't mean anything. We're aboard a freaking starship. The rescue could be anywhere. While they argued, the marines who had received the summons had dressed and run out of the cabin. A batcher looked toward the open door. Tay, the briefing's in five minutes. I have to be there. Come on, she urged. When do I ever ask you for a favour? Well, there was a time you made me help you get the cook drunk so you could shave off his eyebrows. OK, but he deserved payback for the slop he serves up. And I distracted that warrant officer for you while you hid her helmet in the freezer. She's a tool and you know it. And let's not forget you persuading me to help you smuggle Boots aboard. Boots was the ship's cat. A stray Talon had rescued from the battle zone at their last engagement. Give me a break, she protested. Boots is the best thing that ever happened to this ship. A batcher shot her a sceptical look. He might have been thinking about the cat's resistance to all attempts to house train him. You have to admit, Talon went on, he keeps the cockroaches down. A batcher gently prized her fingers from his wrist. I have to go. She slumped against the bulkhead. See you later. He put on his uniform in record time and then strode quickly across the cabin, last to leave. Talon felt bad. He would be reprimanded for being late. When he reached the doorway, however, he stopped and turned. She'd been watching him, resigning herself to the fact that she wouldn't be going to the surface. When a batcher halted, she sat up. How do you do it? he asked. Do what? Be so annoying, yet so pitiful at the same time. She jumped to her feet. You gonna let me take your place? In answer, he swept his arm through the doorway, as if inviting her to go out. She leapt up and yelled, Yeah! A pillow thrown by a disgruntled marine hit her square in the middle, but she barely registered it. She was already running toward the door. On her way, she snatched her uniform from her rack with one hand and with her other she grabbed her boots. When she reached a batcher, she leapt up and grabbed him in a quick hug. I owe you, she said, before racing out. But as she reached the junction at the end of the passageway, she remembered something and pulled up abruptly. A batcher had remained in the doorway watching her, his arms folded across his sizeable chest. She called out, Which briefing room? Two. Shit. She ran back the way she'd come. As she reached her friend, he held up his hand for a high five. Talon slapped his palm as she passed him. She was going to Earth, perhaps even to the Britannic Isles, and who knew what she might find out while she was there.
Chapter 3 As the Marines who would take part in the rescue piled into the Daisy's briefing room too, Wright was struck by how young they looked. They had to be at least 18. He didn't think recruitment had become so desperate the BA took on anyone younger, but some of them looked like kids. The men and women quickly took seats. How long had it been since he was as fresh-faced as them? Before he knew it, Wright was rubbing the old wound in his knee. He'd received it at his first engagement when he'd been no older than the Marines in front of him at the Battle of Queen Charlotte Bay, last stronghold of the BA on the Falkland Isles. For more than 16 years, he'd put off getting proper treatment for the injury. He needed the entire joint replaced, the doc had said. The lab could grow new bones and cartilage from his stem cells prior to the op, but afterward it would be two weeks before he was fit to return to duty. There had always been something happening that deterred him from taking so much sick leave, an upsurge in EAC attacks, new illegal resource harvesting by the Antarctic Project, or influxes of new recruits, refugees fleeing lost homelands. Time had slipped by so fast. He took a head count. Only 19 Marines were present. Irritated, he decided to wait another minute for the latecomer. All his life he'd known nothing but war. When he'd joined up, the struggle had already lasted 58 years. He'd been in primary school when he'd learned about its origins. The Antarctic Project had been the instigator. Intent on harvesting the remainder of Earth's depleted resources to build gigantic colony ships, the AP had been looting the planet, and it had been invading protected zones to stock up on the finest genetic material from all species, including humankind. As governments defied the project, it had militarised. What it had once stolen by stealth or political machinations, it now took by force. Few had been able to withstand its march across the globe. Only the Britannic Alliance had managed to hold it back, safeguarding the homelands and historical territories. Elsewhere in the world, the AP had done as it wanted, and sovereign nations had been too cowed to stop it. Then the Earth Awareness Crusade had appeared. When the organisation first emerged, the EAC had seemed to be one of the BA's strongest supporters and allies, sharing the ideals of conservancy and preservation. But as the months and years wore on, the crusade had shown its true colours. The BA's policy was to maintain the political status quo in the member states of its protectorate, never interfering in their governance but the EAC would constantly try to subtly subvert this aim. Political leaders would die in mysterious circumstances and their replacements would champion new and strange paradigms, ideas that happened to be central to the EAC. After several repeats of these strange occurrences, the BA realised these events were not coincidences, that the EAC was secretly asserting control. What was more, it was turning the newly acquired country's populations towards bizarre, cultish belief systems at odds with concepts of personal autonomy and basic human rights. And now the BA seemed to be fighting a rearguard action. No superior officer had ever described it that way within his hearing, but year after year they lost more ground, either seized by the AP were taken over by the EAC, displacing entire populations. He frowned. He didn't know the solution. Perhaps the higher-ups had something up their sleeves. Someone coughed, and Wright was mentally jerked back to the briefing. The latecomer still hadn't arrived. He was annoyed and surprised. He'd chosen the best from the platoon across the skill spectrum, he didn't have much of an idea what they would face, so he'd wanted to cover all the bases. The last thing he'd expected was that one of the exemplary marines would be late. He would find out who it was later. He didn't want to waste any more time. He quickly opened the briefing and then said, 
We touched down in... He looked up and left, activating a clock that superimposed on his vision. 38 minutes. As I explained in the comm, this is a... The sound of a pair of rapidly running, booted feet echoed through the doorway. A woman burst into the room and stood to attention before noticing everyone except Wright was sitting down. She jumped into the nearest empty seat, keeping her eyes forward. One of her boots was unlaced. Her arrival seemed to send a ripple through the room. Clenching his jaw, Wright strode to the latecomer, coming to a halt a few centimetres from her. Name, he demanded. Ellis, sir. Here to replace a batcher. Replace? He remembered he'd picked a batcher because the man was proficient at hand-to-hand -hand combat. If they did meet any hostiles in the mountains of Westby Eye, the fight was likely to be up close and personal. He's sick, sir, continued the self-appointed replacement. Threw up all over his rack as soon as... Ellis, chided Sergeant Elphick, sitting to her left. Wright looked the woman up and down. He didn't recall seeing her before. She wasn't young like the others. She was closer to his own age. Her rank implied she'd joined up recently, unless her performance had been so appalling she hadn't been promoted once in 15 years of service. She was average build, her hair mouse brown and cut just below her ears. Her cool grey eyes remained fixed forward. The rest of the team didn't like her. That was what the non-verbal reaction had been about when she entered the room. He wondered what she'd done to earn the other Marines' animosity. Disappointed that he was down one of the platoon's best fighters, he hoped a batcher's mediocre replacement wouldn't prove too much of a liability. Wright returned to the front, reminding himself to check Ellis's story later. Addressing the room, he said, We're going into B.I. Had that annoying Marine jumped a little? Currently EAC held territory, he continued. I'm going to be honest. It's a rescue mission, but I don't have a clue who we're rescuing. All we have are the distress signal coordinates. This area isn't well defended as far as we can tell, but the EAC is not going to miss the Daisy's arrival. Once we're on the ground, speed is going to make all the difference to our success or failure. We have to rescue this person or persons and get out of there before the EAC arrive. Flight time from the nearest military airport is 35 minutes and we can expect them to detect us going in. So that leaves us with very little time. He went on to share as many details of the mission as he could tell them, but they were precious few. Within a couple of minutes, he was finished. He told the Marines to suit up. Chapter 4 The daisy's ramp split from the bulkhead and began to lower. Instantly, snowflakes whirled through the gap. As the outdoor air flooded in, Talon watched the temperature displayed on her HUD drop to minus two degrees C. It was a cold night. Along with the rest of the team, she lined up at the opening hatch. Ahead of her, a square of black night appeared, pierced by the corvette's lights. In the few months since completing basic, she hadn't got her space legs, and she was feeling like her stomach remained somewhere in the upper stratosphere. But she was jubilant. She was returning to her homeland. Despite the risks of persuading a batcher to allow her to take his place, she had no regrets. Anything she could find out while she was home could be useful. The only downside was the short time they would be there. So far they'd been lucky. The daisy hadn't been fired upon during the descent. The EAC must have had the surprise of its life when the BA warship swooped down from open skies, but even now it would be rushing to challenge the invasion. The ramp hit the ground. Move out, came Elphick's order. Talon jogged into the night, her rifle gripped across her chest, snowflakes melting on her visor. As she left the daisy, the ship's lights cut out and her visor's night vision kicked in. A grey-green, rocky landscape appeared, cracks and hollows already filling with snow. The distress signal pulsed high on her display. According to the map overlay, 
It originated 634 metres north-northwest and 178 metres up. The Marines in front were already running up the rising ground, seeking paths between the boulders. Others were flanking out right and left, sweeping for hostiles. Her job was to protect the core team, who would push forward and make the rescue. As she looked from side to side, checking for movement or spots of heat that might signify enemy soldiers, she scanned for long-range data too. Her suit's computer soon began to extrapolate from the surrounding topography and narrow down the potential places. It quickly told her she was in West B.I. Yes! It was more than she could have hoped for. The European mainland would have been good, the Britannic Isles even better, but the land of her father's? It was as if it was meant to be. Her computer identified a settlement in a valley to the east, naming it Trekenith. She turned her head sharply to the right, knowing what she would find. The name Evil Isaf popped up on her HUD. She'd been there once, as a child. It was a tiny, old-fashioned village, a place out of time. She'd gone into its only shop and bought sweets with actual cash, not via a teletrans or even a card, but a paper note her grandpa had handed her before she set out. And then, as well as a bag of delicious chewy gums, the shopkeeper had given her round pieces of metal he called change. From the corner of her eye, she saw movement. She jerked her head around. The mountainous landscape spread out, grey-green, speckled with falling flakes, and still. Nothing. Had she imagined it? She slowed to a stop and squatted behind a rock for cover. Leaning her back against the stone surface, she replayed her helmet recording of one minute prior. There it was! She froze the recording. She had seen something. She expanded the frozen image and brought up what looked like a shoulder and half a head poking out from behind a rock, among fuzzy, motionless snowflakes. The rest of her team was clearly marked on her HUD, the closest fellow marine seven or eight metres away. Whatever was out there, it wasn't one of her own. They were being watched, and she'd caught one of the watchers just before he ducked out of sight. Sergeant, she conned to Elphick, we have a voyeur. She relayed the image and the figure's coordinates. Good spot, Elphick replied. Blake, Chen, McKendry, assist Ellis in dispatching the Gorpa. It seemed odd the EAC had operatives out here in this lonely place, assuming the watcher was EAC. He was suited up, so Talon guessed he had to be. How many more of them were out there on the hillside? It was already too late to prevent him from sending a message to his command. If the arrival of the Daisy hadn't been enough to trigger an imminent attack, the Marines were now on a rapid countdown before the soldiers' buddies turned up. Talon rose and, keeping low, began to circle to the right, round to the rear of the hostile's position. On her HUD, she saw Chen do the same in the other direction, while Blake and McKendry slowly approached him from the front. If the onlooker was alone, they would catch him easily as they closed in. Eyes open, said Blake. Don't forget there might be more of them. If the soldier wasn't by himself, Talon might have to make and lose some new friends en route but there was nothing of military interest in the remote place. She couldn't believe the EAC would have many troops on the ground. She was five metres from the man, who didn't seem to have moved, when, as she stepped between two boulders, her right boot slid down into the gap. She cursed and tried to pull it out, but it was jammed in. After a couple of seconds of tugging, Chen asked, "'What's up, Ellis?' He must have noticed she'd stopped. I'm stuck, but I'll be... Shit! Her boot had slipped farther down. The narrow gap opened up at the bottom, and in her struggles she'd accidentally pushed when she'd meant to pull. 
Now her foot was free below the opening, but she was trapped by her ankle. She let her rifle swing from her neck and shoulder and braced herself by her elbows against the rock on each side. They were slippery with crystalline ice. With great effort, she wrenched her leg upward. The hard stone ground into her ankle bones, but she couldn't free her foot. Meanwhile, the other three marines had nearly reached their target. Going in without you, Ellis, McKendry said. No, she protested. Wait! She groaned as she twisted her lower leg, feeling the bite of solid mineral and the tearing of her skin. Nothing seemed to help. It was no good. She was well and truly trapped. We don't have time, came McKendry's impassive reply. Talon swore some more. The friendly dots on her HUD showed McKendry and the others drawing closer to the watcher. There wasn't anything she could do to help her team now, but she guessed they would be OK. It was three against one, and they were all experienced Marines. She returned her attention to her foot and noticed that the gap between the boulders was uneven. If she could squeeze her ankle forward, she would reach a wider area where she might be able to lift her boot out. A voice burst from her comm. Chen, watch out! It was Blake. Flashes exploded to her left. Damn! Her team was under attack. The EAC had closed in on them. She desperately tried to force her lower leg forward. More flashes erupted to her left. On her HUD she saw, with horror, the dot representing Chen wink from green to blue. He was gone, dead in an instant. Their sergeant had seen it too. Blake, barked Elphick. Sit rep. We've lost... shit. I think... I think there's four of them. Pulse rounds split the night. Blake's comm remained open. Everyone connected heard his scream. His dot changed colour. Talon yelled, no! She'd managed to push her ankle forward, but now it felt like it was cemented in. She couldn't move it a millimetre in any direction. With a cry of frustration, she lifted her rifle above the boulder and pointed it upward. Squeezing the trigger, she let off round after round frantically trying to draw attention away from McKendry, the remaining living marine of the three who had joined her to kill the Watcher. McKendry's dot turned blue. Elphick's curse came over her comm. Ellis, what the hell are you doing? Why haven't you moved for the last two minutes? I'm stuck, sir. I... She swallowed. Three fellow marines had died and there hadn't been anything she could do about it. Stuck? What do you mean? My foot's trapped. Can you take off your boot? Negative, sir. Even if she'd been able to reach through the gap, her ankle was now wedged so tightly, removing her boot wouldn't make any difference. Well, I can see you've discharged your weapon, said Elphick stonily, and announced your location to the world. I can't send anyone to help. We're under fire here. You're on your own. Talon could see the flashes of pulse rifles firing higher up the mountain. The place was crawling with EAC, though even sheep would see no reason to be out on the mountain in the middle of winter. In her peripheral vision, something moved. They were coming for her. I understand, sir she said. Elphick paused a beat. Good luck, Ellis. Over and out. Chapter 5 The distress signal blinked stubbornly on Wright's HUD. Glaring at it, he adjusted his scanners, short and long range, for the second time, but the result was the same. It was coming from inside the mountain. He looked up the slope. The mountain face rose above him and disappeared from sight into darkness and falling snow. Nothing he saw indicated the presence of a passage into the hidden chamber. Behind him, farther down the mountain, EAC troops were closing in. 
The organisation had responded fast to the Daisy's arrival. He had to give them that. Unbelievably fast. Elphick would keep the enemy back for a while, but not indefinitely. Wright estimated he had maybe ten minutes, fifteen tops, to retrieve the person or people in distress. But how was he supposed to do that when they were behind several tons of rock? He tried calming them on the same frequency as the distress signal, but received no reply, and no other frequencies generated a response either. Something else was bothering him deeply. How the hell was the signal penetrating solid stone? None of it made any sense. Should I scout for an entrance, sir? asked Marx, one of the three marines accompanying him. Yes, do that. He didn't hold out much hope the woman would find anything, but he didn't know what else to do. Maybe the people sending the signal had travelled through the mountain from another spot and discovered there was no way out. Thinking about it, that was the only answer, but it didn't help him. He climbed the final few metres up to the vertical mountain face. On a closer look, it appeared as though it might have formed from a rockfall eons ago. The surface was jagged and split and tough, stunted shrubs sprouted from the nooks and crannies. Thin cracks divided the crammed rocks, but they were far too narrow for a human being to have slipped through. Even a child wouldn't have made it. Judging from the long, leathery roots that gripped the stone, it hadn't been disturbed for years. Wright rested one hand on the impenetrable surface and, with the other, popped open his visor. Hello? he shouted. This is Major Wright of the Britannic Alliance. Can you hear me? Please respond. He awaited a reply, but all he heard was the hiss of pulse fire coming from below and the sigh of the wind around the mountain. He tried to make contact a couple more times with the same result. He thumped the stone with a fist. Somewhere not far from where he stood, people were trapped, possibly injured or dying, and he had no way of reaching them. Marx returned. I couldn't find anything, sir, she reported breathlessly. Should they stick around trying to find a way in? The chances of a safe exit for his marines was growing slimmer. Or should he abandon the mission as hopeless? Could he justify continuing to risk the lives of his men and women? Can I make a suggestion, sir? asked Marx. I'm all ears. Blow it open. Blow the rock face? We brought an XM57 along, Marx said. We could try. What do we have to lose? What we have to lose are the very people we are supposed to be rescuing, if they are anywhere near the outer wall. White wondered what Colburn would have to say if he returned to the Valiant, bearing several rescued corpses. Sir, said Elphick, there's been a skirmish on the lower slopes. Blake, Chen and McKendry have blued. White closed his eyes. Damn it. OK, he said to Marx. We'll give it one try. He gave the order for the XM57 to be brought up. While he was waiting for the mortar to arrive, he yelled toward the rock face some more, telling anyone who was inside to move deep into the mountain. He guessed there was a good chance they would cause a rockfall, but he was out of time and ideas. Marx had been surveying the rock face. She inserted a hand into a gap. I think here would be best. In response to Wright's questioning look, she continued, My family are miners. They all work for the AP, she grimaced. I switched sides. He nodded and moved away down the slope. You take the lead. The XM57 bearer, Cole, appeared, scrambling over rocks, scattering scree as he climbed with the mortar on his shoulder. Marks quickly directed him to a position to stand the weapon and indicated where he was to fire. Wright gave the order for everyone else to stay well away. The whoomph of the mortar was magnitudes louder than the soft hiss of a pulse round. Wright received the full force through his still open visor. When the missile hit the mountainside, there was an ear-splitting explosion. Rock crumbled and fell. He ran up the slope, but when the dust cleared, the mountain face remained solid. One more try, sir 
said Marx. If there's a cave there, I'm sure we'll break through next time. Just one. Then we're out of here. Marx gave more instructions and the XM57 fired once more. After the second hit, the ground shook and large stones tumbled down. She ran up the slope. We're in! The dust began to clear and Wright saw what she meant. Among the shattered debris, a cleft had opened. Wait, he ordered, hurrying to catch up to the young Marine who was about to enter it. Marx halted. Her helmeted head turned toward him. Get back, said Wright, conscious the opening could collapse any minute. He passed her and leaned into the dark interior. His helmet light revealed a small space, only roughly four metres wide and deep, though the roof of the cave was higher. It rose to a central point about six metres above. It looked naturally formed, with a dusty sloping floor and a rugged ceiling and walls. More than half the space was taken up with rubble from the mortar fire. He tensed. Were people buried under the broken rocks? He closed his visor. His enhanced view showed no signs of warm bodies as his gaze roved the rocks. He swept the rest of the place. No one seemed to be in the chamber at all. No people, no transmission equipment and no exit. The rear wall was solid rock. Except... On the far side of the chamber, something glowed very faintly. The gap they'd blown open was narrow. He had to turn sideways to ease through it. A few steps across the chamber brought him to the scant heat source. At step three, he thought he might be able to save someone's life. But by the time he reached the figure, that hope was gone. He stared down at it. What lay upon the flat, raised, carved surface was barely recognisable as human. Fleshless skin stretched taut over the bones. The closed eyes were wells in their sockets and the hair was wisp thin, clinging to the scalp. The prone body might once have been a large man, but he had died years ago, probably due to the large wound that had torn open his stomach and chest. The corpse wore strange ornaments. A thick torque encircled his neck and another gripped his bicep, the pure gold gleaming richly, uncorrupted by the passage of years. The same could not be said of his clothes, which had rotted away to bare threads, exposing the man's skin in many places. Across his shoulders and upper chest, stylized tattoos of animals pranced, fixed in time. Wright had heard of cadavers like these. In very dry conditions, the human body didn't rot, but remained whole and preserved for millennia. He guessed the heat the body was giving off was caused by extremely slow decomposition. At another place and time, he might have found the mummy interesting, but right now it was only a distraction. He scanned the rest of the cave again. There were definitely no other exits other than the one the mortar fire had created. He concluded the body must have been placed there before the rockfall sealed off the place. Other than that, the cave was entirely empty. So where was the distress signal coming from? He checked his HUD for it and sucked in a breath. The signal was gone. Marx leaned in through the breach in the wall. Find anyone, sir? No. I thought I told you to get back. It was time to leave. The fighting down slope had to be intensifying. Wright felt sick with disappointment and frustration. The BA had sent a warship into enemy territory and three men were dead for nothing. The distress signal must have been... He had no idea what could have caused it. What's that? asked Marx, focused on the mummy. Nothing important. We're pulling out, heading back to the daisy. The young marine took a final look at the dried-up cadaver and then withdrew. Wright told Elphick the mission was over, but as he went to leave the chamber, he paused. How remarkable it was that the mummy should be here, in the very place where the glitch in the system had placed the distress signal. 
an odd coincidence. If he had never come here, the body would have lain undiscovered for thousands of years, if not forever. Now the chamber had been opened, the EAC would probably find it. It was just the kind of thing they liked. Maybe they could use it in one of their weird ceremonies. Marx reappeared. Are you coming, sir? Yes, I'm on my way. She hesitated. Go, I'll catch you up. His attention had been drawn again to the stunningly beautiful torques around the dead man's neck and arm. It was a shame the EAC would get a hold of them, but he didn't have time to... He started. The thick curve of metal around the mummy's throat had moved, or had it? He bent closer and opened his visor, shining his helmet light down to see the thing more clearly. The talk had only seemed to move a fraction, but it had caught his eye. He exhaled a long breath. It was moving, almost imperceptibly and very, very slowly, the talk was rising and falling, as if the mummy were breathing. He placed a trembling hand on the corpse's chest, but he didn't detect any movement through his thick gloves. What am I thinking? Incredulity gripping him, Wright activated his field medic scanner and requested the general health status. Snapping his visor closed, he read the display. He blinked almost not believing what he was seeing, vaguely wondering if he'd taken a hit to the head. His HUD displayed a health status of 2% and pulse and respiration rates that were impossibly low. He'd only ever seen such poor prognoses for survival in Marines taking their last breaths. Yet this figure lying before him must have been here for years. The man was a living, breathing miracle. How was it possible? But he couldn't spare any more time to wonder at the phenomenon. He had to return to the daisy with his team. He decided he couldn't leave the man there, not while he was still alive. Though he was certain to die soon, he felt obliged to do all he could to save him. He scooped up the fragile figure in both arms, finding it hardly seemed to weigh anything. He carried it across the chamber and gently manoeuvred it through the gap in the wall. A strange feeling coursed through him, a sense of unreality, as if he were awake and aware while in the middle of a dream. When he emerged into the night, the snow had stopped falling and the clouds had cleared. The mountainside was empty. Marx was gone, and so was Cole with the XM57. Way below, distant pulse shots flashed in the darkness, dancing like fireflies. Above, a dark shield curved, bearing 10,000 stars. Chapter 6 Cradling the barely alive man in his arms, Wright sped down the slope, skidding on scree and dodging rocks, trying to find the fastest route among the drifts of fallen snow. Soon he was on the fringes of the firefight and a few poorly aimed pulse rounds came his way. He told his marines he was on his way and they began to lay down covering fire. In a few minutes he reached the base of the mountain and in a few minutes more he was part of the retreat. Now that he was with them, the marines doubled their pace as they ran back to the daisy. While descending the mountain, he'd regularly checked the health status of the emaciated, dehydrated man he'd rescued. Every time he saw the stats, they'd improved. The mummy's chances of survival had improved to 9%, provided he received appropriate medical care. What the treatment would turn out to be, Wright was curious to find out. He didn't think any of the Daisy's docks had ever encountered a case quite like this one. Despite his improving health, the man's appearance hadn't discernibly altered. He looked just as ancient and very, very dead as when Wright had found him. But that was a puzzle for later. Now he had to get everyone safely back into space. The EAC troops hadn't fired on them for a while 
and he had a suspicion why. Elphick calmed him from somewhere ahead. Sir, I think you should know Ellis isn't returning to the ship. Why not? Where is she? As he replied, Wright answered his own question, singling out the Marine's location on his HUD. She was still halfway up the mountain, and she wasn't moving. What the hell was that stupid Marine doing? About 200 metres away, stuck in some rocks, said Elphick. She's immobilised, her foot's trapped. After Chen and the others bought it, I didn't expect her to survive. The EAC were on to her, but she's still there and still alive. The sergeant didn't put the moral dilemma into words. They were tight on time. Should he send someone back to try to free her, risking everyone's lives with a delay, or should he abandon her? Wright chewed over his decision. In the distance he could see the daisy, resting at a slight angle in a field of stubble. Most of the team were nearly at the ship. If he did nothing, everyone except Ellis could be away within minutes, and, if his suspicion was correct, they didn't have much longer than that before they would have more problems to face than the EAC infantry. He also had no clue about how to get her out of her predicament. If she was trapped among the rocks and hadn't managed to free herself, was there any hope someone else could get her out in the scant minutes available? The right thing to do was to sacrifice Ellis to save the team. On the other hand, Colburn's words rang in his ears. They must know we'd never abandon our own. He swore, damn the woman. He'd known from the outset she was a liability. Running to the nearest marine, he said, you, take this man to the ship and carry him straight to sickbay. He passed the figure over. Next, he calmed Marks and Cole and told them to follow him. Finally, he told Elphick what he planned to do and that the Daisy was to depart in ten minutes or earlier if she came under fire, no matter what. That's an order, Sergeant, he said. You understand? Understood, sir. Turning, he set off in the opposite direction back to the mountain, continuing to mentally curse Ellis. What kind of dumb marine would get their damn foot stuck? If he did manage to save her, he was going to check out her story about a batcher being sick for sure. If she'd been lying, he'd put them both in the brig. He might even push for a dishonourable discharge for Ellis. Not a batcher, he was too valuable. The last thing the BA needed was idiots who put others in danger. Now running uphill once more, he scanned the skies. They were clear for now. On his HUD, he saw two dots had broken free from the group near the daisy and were moving in his direction. Marks and Cole were on their way. Another minute's running up the lower slopes brought him half the distance to the trapped marine. He slowed down as he drew nearer to Ellis. It was possible he was walking into a trap. The EAC could be keeping her alive in order to lure in some BA marines. Now that the snow had stopped falling, the grey icy rock stood out sharp and distinct. There was no sign of life in the bare, desolate landscape. Ellis? Yes, sir? Her voice had quivered as if she were frightened. Was it because she was alone and in danger of being left behind? or because an EAC soldier was holding a gun to her head. Sit, Rep. I... I... Shit, I'm sorry, sir. My foot's stuck and... Yeah, Elphick told me. What I need to know is... How to phrase it so he didn't put her in danger. Is there anything else I should know? The question should give her a wide scope for a cryptic answer to warn him she was being held. I don't think so, but you should go back without me. I'll figure something out. Figure something out? You're trapped by your goddamn foot in the middle of nowhere. What the hell do you think you're going to figure out, Marine? Wright stopped himself from saying more. He didn't want to turn into another Colburn, though at moments like these he could see her point of view. Ellis was silent. Her answer seemed to indicate she wasn't being held by the EAC. She was just an idiot. Marks and Cole had made it to 50 metres from his position. He waited as they climbed the final distance. When they'd reached him, he continued on with them. 
This section of the slope was thick with rocks. He stepped down from a boulder and only just redirected his foot in time to avoid stepping on a body. The man was lying face down. Wright identified him from his ID dot, still blue on his HUD. McKendry, said Mark sorrowfully. Wright passed by the corpse. He wanted to take McKendry and the others who had died back for a proper burial, but he didn't have that luxury. He was going to be lucky to save Ellis. He made a down gesture. Crouching as they continued, they slowly climbed the last 30 metres. He told Marks to flank out left and sent Cole to the right. About five metres from her, he finally got a visual on Ellis in the shadow between two boulders. No EAC seemed to be around. One of her legs had sunk into the space between two rocks while the other was bent up and she was holding herself up by propping her elbows on each rock. Holy shit, Marx blurted. What's up? asked Wright. Ellis, how did you do it? Do what? replied Ellis. Oh, you mean... Marx began Wright, but then he saw something that surprised him too. Scattered in the spaces among the rocks between him and the trapped marine lay three EAC corpses. Two had been killed by pulse fire, direct close-range hits to their chests. The third was on his back at Ellis's feet, his visor shattered and the handle of a knife sticking out of his right eye. You killed three of them, Marks continued. Or did the others do it? Three of them? She had to mean three EAC soldiers, but she was on the other side of Ellis. She couldn't be referring to the bodies he could see. Uh, no, I did it, replied the trapped marine. Look, I appreciate you coming back for me, but are you guys going to be able to get me out? I don't see how unless you cut off my leg, and I'd rather keep it and take my chances if it's all the same with you. Did you kill these ones too? asked Cole, setting down the XM57 at right side. Marx, check out the rocks that are trapping Ellis, he said stepping over the dead soldiers. Had Ellis really taken out six hostiles by herself, all while her leg was stuck between two rocks? But he had no time to dwell on the feet. He examined her trapped leg. The rocks to each side were gripping it like a vice. He pushed her calf hard and then tried pulling it toward him. It didn't budge a millimetre. He grasped her lower leg and tugged it upward, with the same result. It wasn't possible to see Ellis's face through her darkened visor, but from her hunched position Wright guessed she was exhausted. He was reminded of a fox he and his father had come across while out in the woods behind his home. The fox had been caught in an illegal trap for many hours and was lying on its side, its eyes closed, panting breaths shaking its ribcage. His dad had freed the fox, but its leg was broken, and as it staggered slowly away, barely able to move, he'd lifted his shotgun and killed it. Is there a way we can blast these rocks to get her out? Wright asked Marx, who had watched his attempts. She examined the two boulders from all sides. When she replied, it was over one-to-one -one com. A hit from a mortar would definitely free her, and her suit would give her some protection, but whether she'll survive, I just don't know. He grimaced and wondered if he'd made the right decision to come back. He checked the time. They had less than three minutes to get to the daisy. Ellis, he said, we can try to shift these rocks with mortar fire, but it might kill you. What do you say? I need your answer immediately. For a moment, she didn't reply. Then he heard her say softly, Do it. In the end, the explosion didn't kill her, but it hurt her badly and knocked her out. Blood seeped through the breaches in her armour and her visor was blown out. Wright scooped the unconscious woman from among the broken rock fragments and put her over his shoulder. Now it would be a sprint to get back to the daisy before she took off. He raced down the mountainside, struggling to keep his balance. He had the weight of Ellis plus her armour on one side and the slippery rocks to contend with, but somehow he managed to stay on his feet. 
Marx quickly drew ahead of him, but Cole was by his side, burdened by the XM57. Wright told him to drop the weapon. He would answer to Colburn for it later, but the man had risked his life for a fellow Marine without question. Suddenly, a whine ran through the atmosphere. It was as Wright had feared. The EAC had told its troops to withdraw because jets were on their way. It was planning an airstrike. His lungs heaving, he sped up, taking crazy risks as he leapt down the mountain. He reached level ground and hit it running. Cole was ahead of him now. He and Marx would make it to the ship, Wright was sure, but for him and Ellis it was going to be close. He didn't even know if she was still alive. The going was easier now the terrain was flat, but he felt as though his chest would burst. The open hatch of the daisy and the ramp leading up to it seemed impossibly far away. Wright felt Ellis move. She was coming around. He heard her groan, then... I can't feel my legs, she said. Chapter 7 The colony ship Brez stretched 385 kilometres from tip to tip of her spiral structure and the diameter of each turn of the corkscrew was exactly 93 kilometres. Her engine spread over one of the spiral tips like a colossal umbrella and a cylinder that ran through the centre of the ship held the fuel enough for more than 3,000 years of travel. Coupled with the engine's space-time compression capability, the ship could carry its passengers throughout the galaxy in their search for a new, habitable world. For who knew how long it would take to find a planet suitable for colonisation? The information on exoplanets gleaned by space telescopes over the centuries told of several potential candidates, but only visiting them would reveal for certain whether they could sustain human life. It was possible none were viable in that way, and the search would continue. How long might the colonists spend in torpor, the processes of their bodies slow to an almost unmeasurable pace? How long before they could open their eyes upon their new, untouched world, rich in resources? These were questions Lorcan Ua Tolman had pondered over the years as the building of the Brez and her sister ships, Balor and Bamba, progressed. He rose from his seat at the centre of the Brez's central control room and picked up three soft balls, red, green and blue, from a small round top table at his side. As he began to stroll around, he tossed the balls in a simple circular pattern. Juggling helped him think, and it helped keep his team on their toes. Nervousness mounted in the men and women as he walked the open spaces between their workstations. Stedman, head of engineering, was casting glances his way. Kakoa, responsible for sustainable habitats, had become strangely still and rigid, and the suspended animation specialist, Jura, was clenching and unclenching his fists where they rested on his console. Less important team members echoed their disquiet. Lorcan smiled. He sauntered to the screen that occupied the entire wall of one end of the room. At the moment, the display featured a section of the Alciere Drive, where drones hovered over its surfaces as they worked, arriving and departing, transporting new parts and tools. He commanded views of other zones within the Brez to be displayed, both the completed and uncompleted areas. New scenes appeared on the screen agricultural regions, laboratories, life support hubs, banks of cryo chambers, storage cells for the vast stock of organisms to be taken along, and living quarters where the colonists, the cream of humanity's genetic heritage, would spend months of respite from the physical toll of deep hibernation. All the while, as Lorcan assessed the progress of the shipbuilding project, he juggled, meditative. Brez was to be the lead ship of the three colony vessels, his ship, where he would live for a few short years, but sleep away hundreds, perhaps thousands, 
ensconced in a fluid-filled capsule. Before he could entrust his life to his ship, she must be perfect. One of the recreation habitats appeared on the display, an expanse of water surrounded by temperate forest. Young trees mounted the slopes to what appeared to be a blue, cloud-filled sky, though it was only an illusion created on the overarching dome. Lorcan studied the habitat for a long moment, then he spun on his heel, took aim and threw. Kakoa ducked, but not fast enough. The ball hit her forehead. The small motions and noises within the control room abruptly halted. There had been a time when Lorcan's behaviour would have drawn sniggers and giggles from the people responsible for the Brezzi's construction, at least from those who weren't his target, but that time had passed long ago. He marched to Kokoa, who sat cowering at her desk. She lifted her gaze to him and then closed her eyes just before he launched the second and third balls at her head. They struck her and dropped with soft thunks to the floor between her feet. Dunderhead, he said between his teeth. Lowering himself until his head was level with hers, he added, his voice increasing in volume. Fool! Buffoon! Idiot! Straightening up, he stabbed the index finger of his long right hand at the screen. What is that? Kokoa leaned to one side to see around him. Uh, Westlake? You sound like you're asking me a question. Is it Westlake or isn't it? I would have thought you might recognise it, considering you built it. Westlake, said Kokoa more firmly. And what is wrong with it? Wrong with it? That's funny, there seems to be an echo in here. Um... Kokoa gave a short, tense cough. Uh, she frowned and squinted at the image on the display. When no answer appeared to come to her, she looked for help toward other members of the team, but everyone except herself and Lorcan was staring steadfastly at their consoles. She swallowed. I'm afraid I don't know. Of course you don't know. I'm surrounded by nitwits, simpletons. Ignoramuses! Lorcan slapped Kokoa's desk. Turning to address the room, he continued, And to think you're the prime of your fields, the best I could find. If you represent Earth's elite scientists, the future of humankind is doomed. What will become of us? He snapped his head around to focus on Kokoa again. Waves! Where are the waves? That stretch of water is still as a dew pond. Is there a waterfall? Are there feeder tributaries tumbling down from higher ground through the forest? Kokoa quickly ran fingertips over her console as she sought the information. No, said Lorcan, triumphant, yet angry that he knew the woman's work better than she knew it herself. So where is the oxygen going to come from? Yes, yes, I see. She covered her eyes with one hand. I see now. Do you? Do you really? Or must I spell it out? Without oxygen, within a few years, the water will become as stagnant as a Mississippi swamp. All the precious fish and water creatures you've seeded it with will die. The entire lake will be one murky, stinking mess. Waves said Kokoa. I'll get on it right away. You need wind generators, I know. Wind generators indeed. Without wind, that lake will die. And what's more, the trees surrounding it will eventually collapse. Their roots too weak to support their weight. Lorcan ambled toward his seat, leaving his juggling balls where they lay at Kokoa's feet. Eventually, someone would summon the courage to pick them up and return them to the small table. Kokoa's fingers flew over her console as she tried to source wind generators from the Brezzi's stocks or, if none were to be found, to order some from the Antarctic Project's manufacturing plants on Earth.
Despite her tension and haste, she found time to monitor Lorcan's progress across the room, as if she were waiting for something. The rest of the control room seemed in suspense too. When Lorcan reached his seat and lowered himself into it, he noticed, from the corners of his eyes, Kokoa's figure relax. I was forgetting, he said to her. That'll be one month's salary for your mistake. Try not to make another, or you'll end up owing me money. Kokoa hung her head. Stretching out one of his long legs and placing his elbows on his arm rests, Lorcan rubbed a fingertip across his lips and smirked. But his pleasure at punishing Kokoa soon faded. The woman shouldn't have made such a simple mistake, especially not one that he, an amateur, could pick up. What else had she missed? If the habitats aboard Brez, Balor and Banba were not truly self-sustaining, the effect could be more dire than the colonists simply having no natural landscapes to enjoy during their respite periods. The flora and fauna the ships were sustaining could die, and when they settled a new planet, the colonists would be forced to rely only upon the stored gametes to create Earth's organisms. The project was a unique, unprecedented venture. There was no telling what species might be useful or essential to humanity's survival in its new home or homes. He was not prepared to accept any unnecessary increase to the risk of failure. It was humanity's destiny to travel beyond the solar system and spread across the galaxy. It was his destiny, the explanation for his loss and the whole reason for his existence. He would not fail. Chapter 8 The sick bay aboard the Daisy wasn't equipped to deal with Ellis's wounds so Wright had her transferred directly to the Valiant as soon as the corvette returned from the surface. An extended debriefing session with Colburn followed, during which he doubted she would have believed his account if it weren't for the undeniable evidence of the mummy. When the brigadier finally dismissed him and he'd showered and changed, he decided to pay the injured marine a visit. He discovered that the severely dehydrated man had been placed in a room set aside for cases that required intensive care. As he entered the main area, a medic in full protective gear and carrying a vial of blood emerged from the room and hurried off, paying the Major no attention. He had been worried the duty doc might prevent him from seeing Ellis so soon after her surgery but it seemed the medical staff were too preoccupied with their new patient to bother about a regular marine. She was wearing a full torso cast, and one of her legs was held up by suspension wires. Her arms appeared unaffected by the mortar blast, aside from reddening. She was resting an interface on her chest and watching it, her head raised on a pillow. It was the quiet shift. Aside from the glow emanating from the window to the intensive care room, the ward was only in half light. Two other patients were there, but they were asleep. Ellis's face was lit by the illumination from her interface. She was frowning slightly as she watched it and also wearing a look of intense happiness that made him reluctant to interrupt. He was about to turn around and leave when she noticed him. Major Wright? Sorry, sir, I didn't... She tried to sit up and salute simultaneously. In her position, neither was possible, and her efforts caused the interface to slip from her hands. Wright dove for it and caught it just before it hit the floor. Shit, Ellis exclaimed. I mean, she was still, for some unknown reason, trying to sit up. At ease, Marine. She relaxed. Her gaze travelled to the interface in his hand. Sir, could I? Curiosity overcame him, and though he felt bad about the invasion of privacy, he took a glance at the screen before passing it over. All he saw was a children's playground, nothing special. She turned the interface screen downward and put it on the table next to her bed. How are you doing? Wright asked. Pretty good, thanks. They fixed up my spine. The doc said they did something to trigger the nerves to regrow and I shouldn't have any long-term effects. 
and they gave me some strong painkillers, so I'm high as a kite. As if suddenly realising who she was talking to, Ellis's slightly unfocused eyes widened. Um, what I meant to say was, Wright chuckled, it's okay. Do you mind if I... He gestured toward a chair. Go ahead. She watched as he slid the chair closer and sat down. Leaning forward, he rested his elbows on his knees. He wasn't sure how to broach the subject he wanted to discuss. You don't have to pussyfoot around, said Ellis. I'm a big girl. Let's just get it over with. He lifted his eyebrows. Get what over with? I have to be disciplined, right? Disciplined for what? Wasting time? Putting other marines' lives in danger? Being a dumbass? I don't know. Something. What? Are you telling me you deliberately got your foot stuck? No. Why would I do that? You said you might be a dumbass. I'm certainly a dumbass, but I'm not that dumb. Right. Did you ask to be rescued? Uh, her eyes moved left as she appeared to try to remember. As I recall, you did not, said Wright. I made the decision to go back for you. Therefore, if anyone was wasting time and putting lives in danger, it was I. It was? Then I guess you must be the... Wright put on his major face. Ellis gave a small cough. Sorry, sir. I want to talk to you about the events that took place after you were trapped. There must have been a lot going on. What do you remember? I remember we lost Chen, McKendry and Blake, Ellis replied sadly. Yeah, said Wright, his expression grave. All good men. He looked toward the separate room in the corner of the sick bay. Had the loss of life been worth it? The question was still open. Only time would tell if the marine's sacrifice had been in vain. He had no idea what he'd found within that mountain in West B.I. and he couldn't imagine how the discovery might benefit the Britannic Alliance. After they were blued, continued Ellis, I knew the EAC knew where I was and they would try to take me out. Luckily, they didn't all get there at once. Whenever an EAC soldier got close enough, I killed them, until, finally, they stopped coming. I thought they must have been recalled for some reason. All I could do then was carry on trying to get my leg free. Then you and Marks and Cole showed up. So here I am, alive, and very grateful. About the EAC soldiers... The officer knit his fingers. We found six of them. You said you'd killed them all yourself. Are you sure that's right? He wanted to give her the chance to change her story. When he'd reached her, she'd been on her own for some time and she was in a lot of pain. She didn't seem the type to exaggerate, but it was possible she'd been confused. Huh? She tried to sit up again, sending her suspended leg swinging. You think I'm lying? Hey, it's just a question. Just a question? Why would I lie about something like that? When Wright didn't answer, she continued, You think I made it up so I'd look good? That I stole kills from the men who died? What the hell? Ellis, he said sternly, remember who you're talking to. High or not, he wasn't going to put up with her insubordination. She slumped onto her bed and stared at the ceiling, her lips set and her jaw muscles twitching. You have to admit it's unusual, he said. Ellis didn't reply. Isn't it? he probed. Is that a question, sir? she asked. Yes. I don't know, sir. You don't? He wasn't sure if her answer was genuine or if she was only being difficult now he'd offended her. I've never been trapped on a mountainside while under attack from EAC soldiers before. Her gaze remained glued to the ceiling. Sir. Wright unknitted his fingers and sat upright, all the while studying her. He found he couldn't read her. He'd looked up her file prior to coming to the sick bay. 
She'd enlisted only a few months previously and had taken part in only two engagements since passing basic. There was no way she could have learned to handle herself so well during her short term of service. The information on her past had been minimal and vague. All he knew was she was from the Britannic Isles, a refugee from the EAC invasion. Conflict conditions on the surface meant for many all their documents were lost, entire life histories vanishing as data centres were destroyed and internet lines severed. If she wasn't exaggerating the truth, he wondered what had happened in Ellis's past that had made her such an effective killer. But he doubted she would tell him now, not in her current outraged, insulted state. He stood up. Let me know when the docs say you're fit to return to duty. We'll talk again. Nothing but silence came from the woman, who seemed to be on the verge of exploding. Wright turned to leave. Sir? Yes? Ellis was deigning to look at him again. Who's in there? she asked, nodding toward the intensive room. I tried asking one of the medics, but they wouldn't tell me a thing. Who did we rescue? Honestly, your guess is as good as mine. Chapter 9 As Lorcan relaxed in his private suite at the end of the working day, a familiar starscape filled the viewing portal. His rooms were one of the few places aboard the Brez that included an actual window looking out into space. Nearly everywhere else, the travellers would rely on screens if they wanted to see outside their ships. He spread an arm over the sofa and gazed out at the stars. Hanging in the void at Earth-Moon Lagrange 4, the slowly whirling constellations didn't alter and the planets wandered into and out of view. Over the years of his ship's construction, the sight had become almost a comfort to him, a reassurance that one day he would look upon a different sight. He wondered what he might see once the ship was underway, during the months or years of relief from life suspension. What new stars, nebulae, comets and galaxies might hove into view. Returning to a more practical state of mind, he reached for one of two glasses of champagne standing on the low table at his knees. As he moved, he checked his ocular display for the time. He tutted before taking a drink and returning the tall flute to the table. His visitor was late. Just as he was about to con the Brez's landing bay to confirm the shuttle's arrival, his door chime sounded. Ah! Rising to his feet and feeling unexpectedly nervous, he instructed the door to open. A woman stood in the doorway, but she didn't immediately enter, apparently allowing time for her appearance to have its full effect. Lorcan didn't blame her. She created quite the impact. Two forward-facing, curved, single horns rose 30 centimetres above her head, forming the structure of her headdress. A grey, iridescent cloth hung between the horns and cascaded down her back to the floor, forming a cloak over her shoulders. Her white inner robe also fell to the floor. Not a strand of her hair was visible. All was wrapped inside a white cloth that encircled her face and head and disappeared beneath her cloak. Sufficient time had passed. She stepped into the room. Silently, she descended the few steps that led to the lowered circular space at the centre of the lounge. Her cloak caught the low light and glimmered. Lorcan admired her showmanship, though he also found it amusing. He wondered how Kokoa, Stedman and Jara would react if he turned up to work in a similar get-up. Thank you for agreeing to speak with me in private, Ua Talman, said the woman. Call me Lorcan, please. Shall we sit? He gestured to an armchair opposite the sofa. Do you mind if I sit here? She pointed at the spot next to Lorcan. Um, not at all. As he sat down, he moved closer to the sofa's corner. It's so difficult to communicate securely these days, said the woman. 
We encrypt, create sealed networks, even send physical messages. Yet something always gets out. She lifted her cloak to spread it out as she sat. Speaking to you face to face seemed the only way of keeping our conversation private. She went on, "You are confident we won't be spied upon here. Thoroughly confident, dear Orr." He was naturally recording every moment of their encounter, but she knew that. His hand rested on the sofa between them, and when she spoke next, she laid hers on top of his. You may call me Carla Lorcan. He stiffened at the touch and slowly slid his hand out before placing it on the back of the sofa, trying to behave casually as if he'd intended the movement all along. Her lips turned up slightly at the corners, though Lorcan thought he also detected a hint of offence taken. He'd never seen the head of the Earth Awareness Crusade in person. Now that he was close to her, he noticed her features were regular and her irises so dark they were almost black. Though her eyebrows were not plucked, they framed her eyes perfectly. As a young man, he would have found her attractive. From the way her gaze roved his face, she appeared to be sizing him up too. He was used to it. Most people he met were momentarily distracted by his red hair, a rare colour in any human population, though he guessed it was more than a third grey now. I confess I was surprised to receive your request, he said. You were? I suppose it is unusual in the circumstances. She turned her attention to the two glasses on the table and picked up the one that was entirely full. Is this champagne? She asked sweetly before sipping the liquid, realizing the faux pas. Lorcan was ashamed to feel a flush spread up from his neck and over his face. The EAC were famously covetous of their rare local speciality products, never exporting them. The only way the Antarctic project could have come into possession of champagne would be via an assault. On an EAC province, still, what was the matter with him? There was something about the woman that unnerved him. He who hadn't been unnerved by any one or anything in a very long time. It is, he admitted. You have me. Genuine champagne from my region in old France. The choice would make you very daring or exceptionally rude. Which is it? I wonder. She reached out and trailed a fingernail up his blushing cheek. He resisted the temptation to snatch the digit away. Perhaps it is a very old vintage, she said, from before the days of the Crusade. Perhaps so, he replied, grabbing the out. I had to provide something fitting for the occasion. I have to confess, I never thought we two would ever meet face to face. Though we aren't strictly enemies any more, neither are we exactly friends. I am gratified that the EAC has turned its attention to grabbing B A territory, and not mine. Shall we get down to business? It's a delight to have the pleasure of your company, Carla, but I'm sure you're here to discuss something important. She put down her glass and shifted in her seat to face him full on. She was perched on the edge of the sofa. You're very direct. I like that. Placing her hands on her lap, she said, "I think it's fair to say we have different and oppositional goals. My organization seeks to celebrate and enshrine the spirit of Mother Earth, while yours wishes to." Her face twisted in an effort to suppress a strong emotion. Shall we say, exploit her resources? I think that accurately summarizes the essence of our aims. Yet one day, she cast her gaze around his suite and to the starscape beyond the window. One day, this starship and the others you're building will be finished. You'll depart the solar system forever and have no further interest in Earth. That's the plan.
But until that time, you'll have a thorn in your side, a thorn that also pricks the EAC. Finally, she was coming to the point. He'd guessed this might be the reason for the clandestine visit. The Britannic Alliance. Exactly, said Dwyer Orr. There was a period when the EAC thought we could work with them, that our philosophies were similar, but sadly that proved not to be the case. They don't understand our ideals and motivations, and theirs, well, theirs are only too apparent. Keep everything exactly as it has been for centuries, for millennia. They have no vision, no spirit, and lately they've been frustrating our efforts at every turn. Is that so? The latest reports I've received stated you've gained considerable ground. We've had several successful encounters lately and added land to our stock, but recently they acquired something that has a deep significance to us. After long years of research and months of scouring the countryside, just as we were on the verge of achieving our goal, they snatched it from beneath our noses. I, we, want it back, very badly. But the BA's military capability remains strong on land, despite the losses we've inflicted. And, as I'm sure you're aware, they control most of near-Earth space. We need help penetrating their defences if we're to retrieve it. Lorcan looked into the woman's dark eyes, his interest piqued. What is this thing you want so badly? She gave a sigh of exasperation. It isn't anything that would interest you, Lorcan. I know what you seek. Raw resources, new technology and uncommon or exceptional organisms. Your thirst for materials and diverse genetic code is legendary. But this isn't anything like that. It's something that only threatens the EAC. Lorcan leaned back and studied her. So you want us to join forces? It makes sense, if only on a temporary basis. I know the BA is blocking your prospecting and mining efforts, and they're fighting us at every turn. If we work together, share our intel and military resources, we can increase concentrated assaults on the Alliance and wipe them from the map. And, as a by-product, you'll get this object. Get it and destroy it. More importantly, the BA won't bother either of us any more. How much longer will it be until you're ready to leave? We're on track to complete all three ships in another four and a half years. I think Mother Earth can withstand another four and a half years of resource gathering. You'll stick to non-EAC land? I'd like some time to assess exactly what we need going forward, but I'm interested in your proposition. I suppose your idea is that when we go, you'll have the planet to yourselves. Carla's features glowed. Yes, our temple will belong to us alone. Lorcan was not one for any kind of religious fervour. The look on Dwyer Orr's face made him uncomfortable. But he hadn't been lying when he'd said her offer tempted him. A reduction in the BA's efforts to thwart his operations would speed up the project immensely. He'd been building the Brez, Balor and Bamba for 18 years, and he hadn't been a young man when it started. Any time he saved would be time he could spend living out the rest of his life on a new planet. You don't have to decide immediately, said Carla. I understand I'm asking you to trust me and take my word. We should relax a little, get to know each other better. With an enigmatic look, she suddenly shrugged off her cloak, allowing it to spill onto the sofa. Lorcan's gaze became fixed on her. What was she up to? Next, she lifted her headdress from her head and placed it behind her on top of the cloak. Putting a hand to each side of her head, she pushed back the white covering to well below her shoulders, revealing smooth, pale skin and long, thick, 
dark brown hair, which she pulled from her dress and spread out. Now she was no longer an imposing figurehead of a powerful cultish sect, but a woman in her prime, confident and sensual. When she raised her face to Lorcan again, he found himself moved by the sight of her, despite his years of self-imposed celibacy. Yet he was confident that, if her intent was to persuade him by seduction, she was going to be disappointed. Chapter 10 Talon lifted the back of her gym shirt. A batcher whistled as he saw the scar from her operation. Impressive. Looks like they cut you bow to stern. She dropped her shirt and faced him. They inserted titanium vertebrae and silicon discs and then they regrew my spinal cord through them. Her friend wrinkled his nose. Gnarly. More like lucky. If I'd been home in Westby Eye, I might never have walked again. If you'd been home, you might not have been blasted from between two boulders. You've got a point. The doc said they could grow replacements for the parts of my spine that were damaged from my stem cells, but Colburn wanted me back on duty ASAP. Something for the future, maybe. Let's start, OK? I really want to get back in shape. They were in the Daisy's gym. Talon had been discharged from sickbay the previous day and she'd taken the first transport from the Valiant to the Corvette, forgetting Wright's request to go and see him. She still hadn't forgiven him for accusing her of lying about the EAC troops she'd killed. What a jerk. She'd thought the Major was OK, or at least a better alternative to that hard-nosed bitch Colburn, but she'd been wrong. Sure, said Abacha. What do you want to do? Knife fight or straight hand to hand? Uh, Talon rolled her shoulders and winced as pain jabbed her spine. Another one of those painkillers wouldn't go amiss, but then she pushed the thought aside. She'd cut down her dosage even before the doc began to wean her off them. The thought of her friend slamming her onto her back on the mat didn't appeal. Knives. We can do hand to hand another time. As a batcher walked to the equipment store to get the blunt training knives, Talon heard a door open above in the observation gallery. Major Wright appeared at the railing and her stomach sank. He rested his arms on it and leaned over, peering down and looking her right in the eyes. She was in deep doo-doo for sure. Why wouldn't he leave her alone? Going to see him after she'd been discharged from the sick bay couldn't be that important. What was he going to do to her? She had a feeling that her excuse of a poor memory wouldn't wash, even though she'd been flying when he gave her the order. Then a second figure arrived and stood next to Wright. Colburn! Talon's stomach sank to her feet. What in all hell was the Brigadier doing here? It didn't require two of them to discipline her, surely. A batcher returned, carrying a knife in each hand, as well as two sparring helmets and protective vests. He registered her expression and then followed her gaze upward. The two officers looked down impassively. Giving a tail and a what-are-they-doing-here look, he passed her a helmet and vest. She returned a damned-if-I-know expression and put on the safety equipment. Neither Wright nor Colburn said anything. They seemed to be there just to watch. A batcher was ready too. He tossed her a knife and she snatched it from the air by its handle. She crouched, shifting her feet apart and bending her knees. A batcher did the same. They began to circle. Talon enjoyed sparring with a batcher. He was skilled, but never held back because she was a woman. He was also never embarrassed or pissed when she beat him, which, so far, she had every time. It hadn't been like that in basic. At first, the other recruits had complimented her, impressed as she won fight after fight. Then, the dark looks and muttered conversations started. Being good was fine. Being too good wasn't acceptable. Soon, there seemed to be some kind of competition going on, as her opponents came at her harder and harder. 
and the trainers didn't intervene, as if they also thought she was too big for her boots. No one ever said anything to her face, but she felt the other's resentment and guessed she had acquired a rep of being stuck up and arrogant. She didn't think she was either of those things. She was just a good fighter, and she was damned if she was going to hold back in order to be popular. Fighting had always been easy for her. It was her dad's doing. From as far back as she could remember, until he died, he'd trained her every day. One of her earliest memories was of him teaching her blocking moves. She recalled, at the age of three or four, running through a set in order, and after that, randomly. She knew if she got them all correct, he would give her a piece of chocolate. Even back then, the confection had been rare and expensive, making it a powerful incentive to learn. As time had gone on, he had taught her more techniques and schooled her in the use of a range of hand weapons, as well as the old pulse rifle he had kept from his days in the military. Sometimes the sessions were gruelling, but Dad wouldn't let her rest until she'd met whatever goal he'd set for the day. She never complained, no matter how much her muscles ached or how sore she was from blows she hadn't managed to deflect. The truth was, despite the pain, she loved it. It hurt, but it felt like learning how to breathe. Mum had despaired at the two of them, always fighting or training, but she had grudgingly admitted that Talon had a talent for it, a genetic trait that she must have inherited from her father. Once, when she'd grown to be a teenager, Dad had told her that, though she was female, she had the ability and stamina of the ancient knights who had fought to repel the Saxon invaders. Her mother said he was daft. With the benefit of hindsight, she'd later realised her father's motive hadn't only been to nurture a special ability in his daughter. At times when they rested, panting and sweating after a tough session, she would sometimes see a certain look in his eyes, a sad, fearful look that chilled her blood. Looking back, she guessed that, even then, he'd known the days of peace in the Britannic Isles wouldn't last forever that one day the EAC would push across the channel and seize the homeland. He knew his family would not be among those who would accept the new regime and their strange religion. For them, it would be fight or die, or both. A batcher lunged. Talon stepped a little to the side, but not far, seeing at the last moment it was a feint, lacking a full commitment. As the man made his true move, an attempt to punch her in the side of her head, she ducked. She launched herself at him, long and low, thudding her shoulder into his chest and driving him upward, lifting him momentarily off his feet. Pain lanced from her spine and she grimaced, trying to ignore it. A batcher's feet hit the ground. Off balance, he staggered and toppled backward. Before he'd entirely fallen, Talon leapt at him, raising her knife but a batcher already had a knee up, ready to deflect her. She landed stomach first on his knee and grunted at the impact, which forced her diaphragm up and expelled the air from her lungs. He forced her off and over. Now she was the underdog. Her friend grabbed her right bicep to keep her knife down as he followed her rolling motion, jabbing his knife at her. With her free hand, she knocked his arm away. Reaching out, she grabbed his wrist and gripped it, immediately twisting it. A batcher grimaced, but didn't drop his knife. Though his other hand remained wrapped around her upper arm, she could still bend her elbow. She jabbed his thigh with the blunt knife. He gasped. They struggled. Her grip on his knife arm was solid. She continued to turn it to an unnatural angle. A batcher thrust his forehead down, trying to headbutt her, but she turned her face away and he only hit her above her ear. Her helmet protected her from the full effect of his blow. All the while, she was jabbing his unprotected thigh. With a grunt of pain, he dropped his knife. In another second, Talon had rolled him over and was on top of him, her blade at his throat. A batcher smiled. Again. If only you played Shang-Chi as well as you fight, little chick. Talon grinned and climbed her feet. Holding out her hand to her friend to pull him up, she replied, 
With your understanding of strategy, you'll be an officer one day, while I'll remain a grunt, butting heads with the other numbskulls. I'm not too sure about that. Another round? She nodded and stepped a couple of paces backward. They fought again, and again. By their fourth bout, she was sweating and breathing heavily, and it was getting very hard to ignore the pain from her healing back. It was also taking her longer and longer to gain the upper hand. At the fifth fight, she was seriously worried she might lose. But she won again. They moved apart and paused, each catching their breaths. Abacha shook his head, flinging droplets of sweat from his nose. He waggled a finger at her. You need a licence. A licence for what? You're a deadly weapon. A snort of laughter came from above. Talon had forgotten about their audience. When she looked up, she saw it was Wright who must have laughed. He was smiling, while Colburn's stony face hadn't cracked. Ignoring the onlookers, Talon said, Call it a day? Yeah, I want to get out of here alive. As she walked past her friend on her way to the equipment store, she shouldered him. Don't be stupid. I would never actually hurt you. Is that so? Tell that to my thigh. It's going to be black and blue tomorrow. I'd hate to fight you if you did want to hurt me. Talon returned her knife to its slot and dropped her training equipment in the sanitizer before walking through the changing room and into the shower room, where she stripped off. She let the hot water sluice the sticky sweat from her skin and then washed her hair, all the while wondering why the two officers had been watching her and a batcher sparring. She hoped they would be gone by the time she left the gym. She re-entered the empty changing room and put on clean clothes before slinging her bag over her shoulder and walking to the exit. The door opened and she found her wish hadn't come true. Wright and Colburn were standing right outside the door in the passageway. Back up, Maureen, said the brigadier. Inwardly groaning, Talon reversed direction. She was tired and her back hurt like a bitch. Why were they intent on harassing her, a nobody of the lowest rank? The two officers followed her in. From what I saw today, you have some skill at close combat, Ellis, said Colburn. And from what Major Wright has told me, you're handy with a rifle too. I'd like to put you to better use than your current rank allows. Not invited to answer, Talon kept silent. I'm promoting you to Corporal and reassigning you to the Valiant, you're to assist in training. Assist is the operative word. You don't have the rank to supervise the sessions, but you may get there depending on your performance. She paused, as if waiting for something. You may speak. Thank you, ma'am. Could I ask? Yes. Could a batcher come with me to the Valiant? He's my sparring partner. He could help me demonstrate moves. I'll consider your request. Supporting training sessions is one thing I have in mind for you. I'm sure I'll find more for you to do. Perhaps some covert missions. Colburn leaned in, focusing on Talon's eyes, which stared ahead. You might receive invitations to work for other branches of the BA's military, or from CIS. You're to ignore them. That's an order. You're a Royal Marine. You're mine. Do you understand? Yes, ma'am. Good. Remember it. Talon was struggling to figure out what this new development could mean. When she'd joined up, her intention had been to help free her homeland from EAC control. She'd had other, more personal motives, but a free West BI would help her achieve them. She wasn't sure this new direction Colburn was pushing her in would allow her to do what was important to her. What's that? the brigadier suddenly asked. She was glaring at Talon's necklace. Her heart rate began to speed up. It's a... Uh, a uh, what? Colburn pressed sarcastically. It's my... my... The words wouldn't come out. Talon was exhausted from the sparring session, in pain and under pressure from this nasty woman. To her shame, T 
tears pricked her eyes. The brigadier reached for her neck and, before she knew what was happening, the woman had fastened her fingers around the necklace and ripped it away from her, breaking the thread. Talon sucked in a horrified breath. This is not regulation, Colburn spat, the necklace dangling from her fingers. You are only to wear the items you've been issued. Without another word, the brigadier pivoted and strode away. Talon's knees turned weak. She wanted to protest, to demand the evil bitch return her property, but she was too shocked. Before she knew it, both Wright and Colburn were at the changing room door. The Major gave her an apologetic look as he stepped through the opening and then the two officers were gone. Chapter 11 Colburn had left the Valiant to attend general council and military meetings at a secret location on the surface. With her departure, tension among everyone aboard had dropped a notch and morale had risen. The reprieve was only going to last a week or so until the brigadier returned. For the time being, however, Wright was in charge, which meant he had to carry out his superior's duties as well as his own. He didn't mind too much. He never had much use for free time anyway. The Royal Marines was his life, his soul even. He'd never wanted anything more and couldn't imagine living any other way. The only thing that came close to his love of serving was sleeping. So devotion to duty wasn't at the forefront of his mind when, after a long day carrying out Colburn's work and his own, he was woken by a message alert just after he'd fallen asleep. Groggy and confused, he slapped behind his ear, trying to silence his comm implant like it was an old-fashioned alarm clock. Then he woke up properly and turned off the alert with his mind. His cabin was pitch black and cool air from the fan wafted over him, just how he liked it for a good night's sleep. Sighing as he remembered this was the second time he'd been woken from a deep slumber recently, he opened the message. It was from the duty dock in the sick bay. The man you rescued from Westby Eye is coming around, Major. I'm not sure how to proceed. I'd appreciate it if you paid us a visit. Coming around? How could that shadow of a human being he'd carried in his arms down the mountainside still be alive? let alone approaching consciousness. He hadn't given the man much thought since completing the mission. As far as he was concerned, his part in what happened to the mystery figure he'd taken from the cave was over, and now it was up to Colburn or other higher-ups to decide what was to be done with him. Only now he was the highest up, on the Valiant anyway. Puffing out a breath of sleepiness and frustration, he sat up and smoothed down the annoying tuft of hair that always appeared after he'd slept. After getting out of bed and quickly pulling on his pants, shirt and shoes, he was out the door and on his way. The main sick bay was empty. Wright stopped outside the intensive care room, unsure if he could go in, and calmed the dock to tell her he'd arrived. It's OK, she replied. Come and see him. As he entered the room, she explained, We're thinking of moving him to the main room tomorrow. We're confident he isn't harbouring anything infectious and he's doing really well. Wright couldn't equate his memory of the dried-up mummy in the mountain cave with the idea of someone doing really well. The doc moved to the side to give him a view of the patient. His mouth fell open. I know, right? said the doc. He's made amazing progress. Self-consciously snapping his jaw shut, Wright walked to the unconscious man's side and stared down at him. The patient remained asleep, but his eyes beneath their lids were moving, and his lips moved too, as if he were having a conversation in his sleep. If it weren't for the blue-black animal tattoos on his upper body, the Major would never have believed this was the same person he'd rescued. He was looking at a tall, well-built man in his thirties. The skin that had been pale, dry and leathery as parchment was now plump and fleshy. 
and the wound on the man's stomach had disappeared as if it had never existed. The sunken eyelids had filled and the wisps of hair had been replaced by a thick fuzz on his face, scalp and lower arms, promising to grow out red gold. His muscular chest rose and fell in a deep, steady rhythm. An electrode at each temple and a drip inserted into the back of his hand were the only signs the man had hovered once between life and death for untold years. On a table next to the bed sat the man's thick, ornate talks. Wright turned to the dock. Can he hear us? It's hard to say. Possibly. Then let's talk outside. Outside intensive care, in the quiet, dimly lit sick bay ward, the doc said, His brain activity is increasing. That's why I messaged you. I expect he'll wake up in an hour or so. Look, I'm out of the loop on this. What's been happening with him? Yeah, sorry, I forgot we've been reporting to Brigadier Colburn. Let me show you his chart. She began to move away, but Wright said, A summary would be fine. Oh, OK. Well, it's been remarkable. I've been the one doing obs on him every day since you brought him in, and even I can't quite believe it. We started him on intravenous fluids immediately, of course, though it was nearly impossible to find a vein, and when we did find one we weren't sure anything would go in. He was hypothermic, too, so we used warm water to irrigate... You probably don't want to know about that part. The doc paused and gave her head a small shake. The fact that he still had a heartbeat while in that condition is a medical impossibility and there's no way his brain could have recovered from the degree of dehydration it suffered. Yet here we are. His brain, liver, kidneys, everything's functioning normally. To try to understand what was happening, I gave the lab some of his inner cheek cells to culture. They found they were reproducing at a phenomenal rate and growing healthier at each new division. I still don't understand it, the doc went on. I have never seen anything like it or read anything comparable in case studies. The lack of precedent means I have zero idea what to expect when he regains consciousness. By all rights, he should have severe brain damage and remain in a vegetative state, but... Honestly, right now, all bets are off. I can't guess what his ongoing health status might be. If the doctor didn't know what to make of her patient, Wright certainly didn't. If the miracle mystery man's history so far was anything to go by, he would probably wake up, invent an intergalactic space drive and disappear to explore the universe. The Major knit his brows. Colburn hadn't left any instructions regarding their surprise visitor. She might even have forgotten about him. She'd seemed preoccupied before leaving for the general council meeting. He didn't want to bother her with non-urgent comms. Should the man be allowed to return to full consciousness? Should he be questioned about what he'd been doing in the cave and where on earth the distress signal had come from? Or should he remain under sedation until Colburn returned and decided what to do with him? A sudden roar of anger came from the intensive care room, followed by yelling in a language Wright didn't recognise. The man from the cave had woken up. The door to the room jerked open and the man stood there, stark naked, blood dripping from his hand where he'd ripped out the cannula. His eyes were round and staring and his body was rigid, his fingers splayed at his sides. Hey, said the doc, you need to... Giving another roar, the man raised a fist and ran at her. Wright dove between them just in time. He grabbed the big guy round his chest and tried to heave him upward, planning to unbalance him and push him to the floor where he might be able to subdue him. But the patient was having none of it. He punched right in the head. Sparks flew into his vision and darkness closed in, but he clung on to the man and concentrated on staying upright. As the threat of unconsciousness cleared, he became aware of someone grabbing his arms, trying to force them apart. He realised his captive was trying to free himself. The Major gripped tighter. 
Another great roar of anger came from the big man's mouth, right tensed, expecting to be punched again. A second hit would put him out of the game for sure, but there wasn't anything he could do to defend himself. If he let go of the patient, he would go for the doctor. The punch didn't come. Instead, he heard a hiss, and the struggling, fighting figure in his arms went limp and very heavy. He found himself trying to hold on to him as the man slipped from his grasp. Put him down gently if you can, said the doc. She was holding up a discharged pressure hypodermic. It's always good to have some knockout juice on hand. Wright squatted and tried to ease the man's fall, but he slumped ungracefully to the floor and knocked his head on the tile. Wright stood up. The man was entirely out of it. His mouth open and his eyes closed. The doc was silently mouthing something, probably sending a com, requesting assistance to get her patient back into bed. Taking a look at the prone figure, Wright said, That decides it. I want him sedated until Colburn gets back and in restraints. Chapter 12 in the Caribbean Kingdom, on the island of Barbados, Hans Jonter, head of the Secret Intelligence Service, was taking a final look in his hotel suite mirror, appraising his tailored suit, polished shoes and groomed beard. His suit fitted like a glove, accentuating his broad chest and narrow hips. His shoes were real leather, including the soles, and they showed it and his beard had been freshly styled that morning. He couldn't fault his appearance. He smiled, nodding approvingly at his reflection. His large, white, even teeth shone. Appearances counted for a lot when you wanted to look the part among the people who count, and the meeting of the General Council was the perfect occasion for that purpose. He went into the bathroom where he'd placed the unique cologne he'd brought along. The scents had been perfectly matched to his pheromones, designed to create an attractive and alluring scent. Visual input was important to humans, but smells were even more important. Aromas triggered emotions and remained embedded as memories so that the whiff of a long-forgotten perfume could conjure up an event from decades ago. And he wanted to be remembered. He puffed the cologne over his neck and face before massaging the fine droplets into his beard and skin. After washing and drying his hands, he left the suite. A few minutes later, he was downstairs and outside the assembly room, which hummed with conversation and anticipation of the momentous discussions about to take place. The BA had suffered a serious blow in the loss of its historic homeland, and something had to be done to win it back. Also, the AP was attacking Australia, sovereign state of Oceania, probably hungry for the uranium mines. Though the mines had been shut down decades ago due to falling interest in nuclear energy, they remained full of the precious ore. Meanwhile, after finding itself blocked by the boundary of the Great Atlantic to the west, the EAC was creeping steadily southward, threatening to take Gibraltar and with it control of the strait. But more than the discussions on how to reverse the tide of the BA's fortunes, everyone was waiting for something else to happen, something even more significant than the debate on the future of the Britannic Alliance. Queen Alice hadn't been seen in public for two years and three months, one week and five days. Hands had been counting. Rumours of her illness, senility and even undisclosed death had run rife. He knew the detail of many of the rumours because he'd been responsible for many of them. People loved to gossip and he loved to give them things to gossip about, especially when it came to Her Majesty. She was scheduled to attend the council in her usual non-participatory capacity. 
Hans had no doubt she would read the speech Parliament had written for her, and then she would affect polite interest in the proceedings until she could gracefully retire. But her presence would achieve the sense of unity and common purpose intended. Hans wondered how much the Prime Minister and the Queen's advisers had implored her to attend the event. The old woman had obviously lost interest and enthusiasm for public life many years ago, but somehow she'd been persuaded to hang on and not abdicate, giving her successor time to grow to manhood. A man made a much better figurehead to a failing monarchy than a young boy. Pausing at the entrance to the assembly room, Hans surveyed the tiered seating around the walls of the oval chamber. The sections designated to the attending groups stood out, even without the benefit of signage. The armed forces occupied a quarter of the available space. The admirals, generals, air marshals, and lower-ranking officers dignified in their dress uniforms. A few generations previously, it would have been unthinkable to invite such a large number of military personnel to a general meeting, but now all and sundry seem to have influence in political affairs. Ministers of Parliament, including the cabinet and the Prime Minister himself, were all dressed formally, similar to hands. Their sombre suits took up another significant chunk of the room. Media reps in more fashionable gear ranged around the upper gallery. Captains of industry had been allotted a portion of the seats, and non-governmental organisations a smaller portion. Out of Sis, only he and his immediate subordinates were attending. Had his officers desired to be present, he had no doubt they did not. The idea was out of the question. Their anonymity was paramount, superseding their right to participate in debates or decision making. Hans walked sedately across the floor of the chamber and climbed the steps that led to his organisation's section. The meeting was about to begin. "Mr. Jonter, you barely made it," said his secretary as he took the seat beside her. "And yet I did," he replied pleasantly. He liked Josephine. She wasn't the sharpest tool in the box, and that suited him perfectly. She never bothered him with awkward questions about his activities, only doing exactly as she was told. Soft chimes began to echo through the chattering, growing gradually louder. The voices quietened down, and after five more resounding chimes, they stopped. The chamber was silent. Parliament's speaker was acting as chairperson. She stood up alone in her box, wearing her traditional black gown. Ministers, ladies, and gentlemen. Welcome to the seven hundred and eighth meeting of the Britannic General Council," she continued with some more platitudes, and then said, "We have a long afternoon ahead of us with many urgent matters to address. Therefore, without any further ado, I would like to welcome to our assembly Her Majesty Alice the Second." Queen of the Britannic Isles and her realms and territories, head of the Commonwealth, commander in chief of the armed forces, and mother of her nations, Hans fidgeted in his seat and suppressed a yawn. Next to the speaker's box, a larger one protruded from the wall. It was empty, but as soon as the introduction was over, the curtains at the rear of the box drew apart, and an old lady in a jewel-encrusted ceremonial dress and wearing a small tiara stepped into the space. All the attendees, including Hans, rose to their feet and bowed. As he lifted his head, Queen Alice raised a frail hand to give her usual wave, cleared her throat, and began to speak. Hans sat down. The woman's quiet, tremulous tone meant that, despite electronic amplification, he could barely make out what she was saying. He didn't think he was alone in that either. Yet all the attendees sat motionless, as if hanging on to her every word. Hans's attention wandered. 
Tall, slim windows divided the seating sections, giving views of a beach and crashing ocean waves on one side of the hotel and deep green vegetation on the other. He watched the waves, his mind travelling along the hidden, twisted paths of his machinations as he waited for the Queen to finish. It didn't matter what the elderly lady said. The words had been placed in her mouth by the people of the establishment, an entity whose primary purpose was to maintain its ancient grip on executive power. Its members wanted everything to go on as it had for thousands of years. They wanted an impotent figurehead, someone who would stand in front of the shadowy elite who controlled everything and viewed that control as an ancestral right, merited deserved and inviolable. But things were about to change. The Queen had no direct heir, and though the line of succession to her late nephew's son was clear, the distance of the relationship would introduce doubt and fragility to the entire question of monarchy in Hans's estimation. He was banking on it, in fact. Now that Alice II's life was drawing to a close, it was the perfect time to bring all his efforts of the previous few years to bear fruit. It was time for the Britannic Alliance to become a republic. It would take back the lands it had lost, defeat the EAC and banish that madman Ua Talman before he drained the earth of her remaining precious resources. The BA was about to be born again in a different and better form. If blood had to be shed for that to happen, so be it. It was only through pain, labour and strife that new life came into the world, and the same was true of new systems of government. Josephine tapped his elbow, retrieving hands from his reverie, and the meeting was about to begin. The Prime Minister rose. Firstly, may I say what a delight it is to see Her Majesty here today and in such good health. Hans rolled his eyes. The Prime Minister fired off a few more platitudes and then handed over to an Undersecretary to give a report on the state of the Alliance. All the woman said was common knowledge. The Britannic Isles remained under EAC control, along with much of Europe and Asia, excepting India and Pakistan, and the Antarctic project continued to steadily strip the resources of many countries. Much of Brazil was infiltrated by the AP's mining companies, which were ransacking the Amazon forest for bauxite. Non-BA countries, including the Middle East and the States, were maintaining their independent, neutral positions. Hans's attention wandered again. He had a far better understanding of the state of things than the overview the Undersecretary was giving. She finished speaking and sat down. At the same time, the Prime Minister gave a small cough and took the podium. He gripped the sides of the lectern and glanced downward at his prompt screen, preparing to begin his speech. Hans expected the PM to express solidarity with BA nations that had fallen, followed by assurances that everything possible was being done to free them. The man would probably then go on to praise the efforts of the military and auxiliary services and state his confidence that the future of the BA was rosy. Her foes would be vanquished and she would eventually return to her former days of glory. That was what Hans was expecting. But just as the PM opened his mouth to speak, a distinct, piercing whine came from overhead. Along with the rest of the attendees, Hans looked upward, puzzled. He saw the chamber's elegantly decorated wooden ceiling, but the noise was coming from outside the building, and it was getting louder. Suddenly, someone among the military ranks screamed, Get down! Then the ceiling exploded. Hans's eardrums burst. He had a brief impression of shattered, fiery splinters raining down and thick smoke blooming. And that was all. 
Chapter 13 Wright unfastened the buttons on his shirt, took it off and pushed it into the laundry chute. Then he took off his pants, folded them neatly and placed them on the single chair in his cabin. He yawned and stretched his arms and back. He'd just finished a double shift, covering for Colburn as well as doing his own work, and he was looking forward to at least six solid hours of blissful slumber. The brigadier was due back in a couple of days, and he thought he was doing a reasonable job of keeping the valiant shipshape and ticking along while she was away. He padded into his tiny shower room and completed his bedtime routine before returning to the main area of his cabin and getting into bed. He thumped his pillow to fluff it up and then buried his head in the soft cushion. After exhaling heavily, he said, Lights off. The room instantly plunged into darkness. He closed his eyes, gave a soft smile and his body entirely relaxed. As he banished the cares of the day from his mind, sweet sleep overtook him. Major! Ugh! Wright opened his eyes. I'm sorry to disturb you, but... Yes, Corporal! There's fighting in the quarters, sir, and Captain Tyler's having trouble getting under control. I thought maybe you'd... I'm on my way. He threw off his covers and got up. Cursing to himself, he quickly put on a fresh shirt, his pants and boots, and then stomped out into the passageway. Whoever was responsible for waking him up was going to pay. The Marines' quarters occupied only one section of the Valiant. As he neared the place, he didn't need to check with Singh which of the cabins was the scene of the fight. When he was still a couple of minutes away, he could hear it. Thuds and bumps, shouts and cheers as watchers egged the fighters on. And over everything, Tyler's impotent shouts, imploring the Marines to cut it out and for everyone to calm down. Wright slammed into the cabin with such fury everyone near the door instantly fell silent and then the effect rippled through the room. Most of the onlookers were clustered in the far corner of the room, where bunks had been knocked away from the bulkhead. Men and women in their underwear looked over their shoulders, saw the Major and began to draw away, slipping into their racks or quickly finding other occupations. All of them tried to look as though they had nothing to do with what was going on. All except Captain Tyler and the fighters. The captain had a split lip, probably from an accidental elbow to the face as he'd tried to pull the small, tussling group apart. Major, said the captain, approaching him. I... Wright shook his head. Tyler fell silent. One Marine lay on the floor, unconscious. Four others were fighting, crushed into a corner, but they were not fighting in pairs. It was three against one. Just as Wright registered the target, crouched with her back to the bulkhead, she punched one of her attackers in the gut and then kneed him in the jaw as he went down. The man's eyes rolled back and he collapsed like a puppet with its strings cut. Wright filled his lungs and then bellowed, ATTENTION! Perhaps because they recognised his voice, or perhaps out of reflexive habit, the two remaining assailants snapped upright, clapping their legs together, putting their arms to their sides and thrusting their shoulders back. Ellis maintained her crouched position, swaying and panting, blood running from her nose and a cut above her eye. Her knuckles were blooded too, but Wright guessed from the state of the bullies' faces the blood might not be her own. Corporal Ellis, stand to attention, yelled Wright. She slowly straightened up, her eyes hard and her jaw set. Her chest heaving, she followed his order. Aside from the heavy breathing of the fighters, the cabin was silent. Captain Tyler, remove these brawlers to the brig. Not you, Ellis, you're to come with me. Their gazes averted, the marines in the cabin parted wordlessly to allow him and the corporal through. Wright didn't speak to Ellis until they'd reached his office. 
Light blinked on in the dark room as they went inside. He sat behind his desk as Ellis followed him in. He rubbed an eye and gave a small sigh. As they traversed the ship, his annoyance at being woken and anger about the fighting had worked themselves out of his system, and now he was only tired and irritated. At ease, he muttered. Ellis's upper lip, nose, and one of her eyes had puffed up and were turning purple. She hadn't bothered to wipe away the blood from her injuries, and it was beginning to crust and turn brown. She looked a sorry sight, but he knew better than to immediately take her side. I need an explanation, Corporal, he said. What the hell was... I want to resign, Ellis interrupted, her voice muffled somewhat by her swollen lip and nose. What? Her answer had been the last thing he'd expected her to say. It took him a second to redirect his thinking. Pull up that chair... She scraped the chair's legs across the floor to his desk before plonking herself down on it. When she'd taken a seat, he went on, Resign? You can't resign. Is this because of what was happening back there? You should know the Royal Marines doesn't tolerate bullying. I'll put a stop to it one way or another. But you can't just walk out. You still have... Uh... He pulled up her file on his interface. Four and a half years to serve yet. Ellis, serving as a Marine isn't like working in a factory or bartending. You can't just leave whenever you feel like it. Didn't you understand that when you enlisted? I want to return to the Britannic Isles, she said stubbornly. With a slight tremor in her voice, she added, I want to go home. He inwardly groaned. A homesick Marine. That was all he needed, especially one Colburn had plans for. The brigadier would not be slow to forget or forgive if, when she got back, Ellis was no longer around. How did the fight start? he asked, in an effort to change the subject. Ellis's mouth remained shut. You were clearly being picked on, he said. Are your cabin mates jealous about your recent promotion? It can piss people off if they think a newcomer is getting preferential treatment. She gave no sign she'd even heard him, let alone that she was going to reply. How are the training sessions going? Silence. Corporal Ellis, I order you to answer. I don't remember how the fight started. Wright thumped his desk. Her insubordination was infuriating. What was going on in your quarters, he asked, raising his voice. Why were those marines attacking you? The woman's gaze flicked to him and away again. All I know is, the one who was knocked out when you arrived, a batcher, he didn't have anything to do with it. They took him out when they first attacked me because they knew he'd defend me. He shouldn't get into trouble for anything. A batcher? The name rang a bell. He'd heard it recently. Wright found the man's file, and as he brought it up, he remembered where he'd heard the name. Ellis had requested that the man be transferred along with her from the Daisy to the Valiant. Wright scanned the file. A batcher had signed up three years prior to Ellis. He had a clean record and had been singled out for a mention in several reports. Then Wright realised another reason why the man's name was familiar. He'd picked him for the rescue mission to West B.I. You took his place on the rescue assignment. You told me he was sick. The oddities surrounding that mission had made him forget the mental note he'd made to check her story. He was sick, sir. She was a bad liar. He reached into his desk drawer, grabbed a packet of wipes and tossed it to her. She took one out and began to gingerly clean the blood from her face. Sounds like a batcher is a good friend. Ellis winced as she pressed the wipe to the cut over her eye, but she didn't answer. Why are you making this so hard? When she still didn't speak, he said, Maybe I should throw you in the brig with the others. How long do you think you'd last in there with them now? She gave him a hurt look, 
and he immediately regretted his threat. I'd be okay, she said. If I'd had more time, I would have wiped the floor with them. He paused, taking in the enigma who sat before him. How had she learned to fight so well? Her short time in the Royal Marines couldn't have taught her that. I bet you would. He put his elbows on the table and leaned forward. Ellis, help me out here. The last thing I want to do is punish a victim of an unprovoked attack, but I need to know for sure you and Abacha really are innocent. Fighting is strictly prohibited. If you refuse to give your I don't care, she enunciated loudly. Don't you understand? I want to leave. I've had enough. I thought if I joined up I might make a difference, but it's been a waste of time. I don't want to be a corporal. I don't want to train other marines. I want to fight. The EAC are everywhere in the BI and the Alliance has done nothing against them. They're in every town, every village. They were even in Nantgarurigarth, for God's sake. The only thing that lives there is sheep. A pause followed as he tried to figure out how to reach her. It would be a crime to let such a valuable person go, and though she might not understand it, she would be more helpful to her cause working within the BA than outside it. Are you from that area? he asked. Her file only stated BI as her address, probably because her town or village didn't exist anymore, having been destroyed in the EAC invasion. Yes, I'm from around there, she replied, and I want to go back. Sheep weren't the only thing living on that mountain, though, were they? What do you mean? Oh, the man you rescued. Yes, I suppose he was there, too. Did you see him? As we brought him back, I mean. No, I didn't. The medics put me under for the trip. I didn't wake up until after the operation on my back, and then he was in intensive care. Hmm, well, he was in a terrible state. He shouldn't have been alive. I wouldn't call his survival a miracle. I'd call it impossible. That's strange. No one in their right mind would be out on the mountain in that kind of weather. Do we know why he was there? Wright shook his head. Not a clue. Though he wasn't in the open, he was inside a cave. We had to use the mortar to get to him, the same as we used it to free you. He began to regain consciousness the other day, and I went to see him. He's entirely recovered, fit and healthy, without any lasting effects, as if nothing had happened to him. But he seems dangerous, so I'm keeping him under sedation until Colburn returns. So you're wondering if I might have an idea about who he is, or what he was doing, as I'm from that area? Right. Do you? No, I can't help you. After the EAC moved in, all my family and friends scattered. I've lost contact, she swallowed. It's been so long. You might still know something. If I had to take a guess, I would say that man was alone in that cave without food or water for a very long time. Quite possibly years. Years? I know. It sounds impossible, right? Come over here. I want to show you something. Relieved that he seemed to have broken through the barrier the corporal had been putting up, he found his cam recording from the day. With Ellis leaning over his shoulder, he played it. Once more, he saw the pitch-black cave interior, his helmet's light slicing through the darkness. The picture shifted and bobbed as he moved in, reaching the stone platform in a few steps. On a second viewing, the dusty figure looked even more skeletal and long dead in the vid than it had appeared the first time around. He heard the corporal suck in a breath. When he saw his own arms reaching out to pick up the man, he turned off the recording. That was what you rescued? breathed Ellis. It was, and that is now 185 centimetres and about 90 kilos of living, breathing muscle. No! How can that be true? Do you want me to show you? 
I could look up his medical file. She returned to her chair and sat down. I'm sorry, I can't explain it. I lived not far from there all my life, but I've never heard of anything like that. I mean, tourists would sometimes get lost and someone would have to go and help them, but that's as much of a mystery to me as it is to you. Her brow was furrowed, but nevertheless Wright had a feeling she was holding something back. He decided not to push her. The patient in the sick bay wasn't a big concern, and he'd achieved his intention of softening the atmosphere between them. Ellis, I'm going to be frank with you. If you're gone when Colburn gets back, my life won't be worth living. And please believe me when I tell you you're going to help free the B.I. better up here than down there. I tell you what, you don't have to tell me anything about the fight. I'll speak to a butcher, and if he says you weren't the instigator, we'll leave it there. She went to say something, but he continued, wait here a minute. He left his office and went into the brigadier's, which was next door. Colburn had given him access to everything in there while she was gone. After a brief search, he found what he was looking for. He returned to his room and handed the broken necklace to the corporal. I think this is yours. The look of elation and gratitude she gave him as she took it told him he'd done the right thing. She teared up and then ducked her head in embarrassment. Are you going to stay a Royal Marine? Wright asked. Er... Uh, she replied, her voice thick. I'll think about it. Chapter 14 A loud ringing underlain by a dull roar throbbed in Hans's ears, and hot smoke filled his nostrils and throat, searing and choking him. He tried to get up, but found he could not. A heavy weight was pressing against his back, pinning him down. He quickly gave up trying to move. Each effort brought a feeling like knives stabbing his lungs. He guessed his ribs were broken. As he lay face downward in the remains of the meeting chamber, he began to assess his situation. There had been an attack. The dreadful whine of the approach of the first bomb remained vivid in his mind. Then the ceiling had exploded. Everyone who hadn't immediately reacted to the warning shout from the military section, most of those present, had dived to the floor. But little could be done to protect oneself from the rain of dagger-like, burning shards of wood. How many had died there and then from the falling debris, Hans didn't know. There had been no time to take stock, no time to take action to protect the still living. Then a second bomb had hit this time blasting open the wall on the far side of the chamber where the Queen, Speaker and Prime Minister had stood to speak. A cacophony of screams of fear and anger followed. Those who were still alive and uninjured had run for the exits. It had been a stampede, a rout. The weakest and unluckiest had fallen underfoot and been trampled. Some of the military officers had tried to take control, but it had been hopeless. Terror had driven the council members mad. They obeyed no order or instruction, heard nothing in their primal instinct to save their lives. Except Josephine. His secretary had been one of the few to keep her head. Hans's section hadn't been devastated by the first or second explosion, but the aisles between the seats were soon thickly jammed by those trying to escape. His staff also tried to exit that way. The people already on the steps became crushed by others trying to join them. He hadn't known what to do. He stood no chance of leaving via that route until the crowding eased, and meanwhile a third bomb seemed likely. Over the seats, Mr. John Tur, Josephine had shouted over the noise. We have to climb over the seats, this way. Lifting her skirt, she stepped neatly across the seat back in front of her. Come on! She held out her hand to encourage him. Of course, in their panic, nearly everyone had reverted to habitual behaviour. The usual way to leave tiered seating was via the stairs, so that's what they were trying to do. Only a handful, like Josephine, had realised there was a much better way to get out. 
He joined his secretary and together they began to climb down. Fire was taking hold in the wooden building. The panic in the room grew even more intense. People were in a frenzy as they tried to retreat from the encroaching flames. The place was going up like tinder. Smoke and ash were obscuring Hans's view of the rest of the chamber. All he could see were shadows of fleeing attendees, and the far side of the room was entirely obscured. He wondered if the Prime Minister and Speaker had been hurt. It seemed impossible they hadn't when their area had taken a direct hit. And what had happened to the Queen? Had she left after she'd given her speech and avoided the bombing? Please hurry, Mr. Jonte, said Josephine. We might be hit again. The fact hadn't escaped him. But others had seen what she and he were doing and had begun to copy them, causing the seating to become crowded with slow-moving seat hoppers. Who was attacking them? It had to be either the AP or EAC. Why had his officers uncovered no intel about the strike? How had the bombers infiltrated BA airspace? Barbados was in the heart of BA territory. The assault was an insult, an outrage. Mr. Jonter! Josephine had nearly reached the bottom of the seating, but she'd stopped and was waiting for him. Paradoxically, the area at the base of the seating wasn't overwhelmed with people yet. Most were still fighting their way down the aisles, and if they now understood their mistake, it was impossible for many to leave their chosen escape route. They were trapped on the stairs, the fallen clogging the bases of the steps. The fires crept closer. A third bomb must have hit, but Hans didn't remember it. One moment he'd been about to reach Josephine, and the next he'd woken up within roaring, choking chaos. He guessed the ringing in his ears was from the explosion of the bomb. He was relieved the flames hadn't reached him yet, but he knew he didn't have much time. With a great effort and agonising stabs from his ribs, he managed to turn his head. Immediately, he came face to face with Josephine's staring eyes. His secretary was lying mere centimetres away. The force from the bomb must have thrown them together as it simultaneously buried them under the destroyed seating. Josephine hadn't survived the blast. A twinge of sadness and regret hit him as he felt her loss. The woman had been more resourceful than he'd given her credit for. That couldn't be helped now. He had only himself to rely on to get out of here. Though something was pinning his torso, his arms were free. Hans dug his elbows into the debris that littered the floor and tried to pull himself forward. It took great effort, but he succeeded in dragging himself a centimetre or two. Whatever was lying across his back had moved with him, however. He wasn't pulling himself out from under it. He reached back with his right hand and touched warm metal. Feeling around, he discovered some kind of strut had landed on him. The chamber wasn't entirely made from wood after all. A skeleton of metal had supported it. The warmth of the steel told him fire wasn't far away. Beyond the ringing of his ears and the roar of flames, he heard running footsteps. He listened and they grew louder. He had no time to turn his head in their direction, but intuitively he shot out a hand, grabbing blindly. His fingers brushed fabric and he gripped hard. A man crashed down, giving a shout of pain as he hit the shattered smoking detritus from the explosions on the floor. Help me, moaned Hans, not loosening his hold on the man's pants leg. Through the smoke, he recognised a sooty, blood-splattered military dress uniform. The man kicked his leg, trying to make hands let go, but his fingers were like iron, certain this officer was all that stood between him and death. All right, the man growled, and reached over hands. His face and hair were black with ash. He felt the strut lying on his back begin to move, causing fresh waves of pain. He gasped, but he didn't relax his grip on his saviour. Grunting with effort, the officer inched the metal farther. Hans felt it slide onto his waist and then lower, moving diagonally. 
When it reached his hips, he found he could wriggle forward, but in doing so, his hand released the pant's leg. You're fine now, said the officer. You can do the rest yourself. The next second, he disappeared into the haze and drifting ashes. Hans swore, but in his heart, he didn't blame his reluctant helper. He would have done the same in the circumstances. But perhaps the officer was right. Perhaps he could rescue himself now. Pressing his palms against the floor, he tensed his stomach muscles and, grimacing at the shouts of protest from his broken ribs, levered himself upward. The strut slipped off him and clattered somewhere behind. He was free. He staggered upright. Instantly, a wave of coughing overcame him, sending him to his knees. The air was unbreathable. He began to feel faint and nauseated. He started crawling. Where was the way out? He had no idea in which direction he now faced, and nothing he saw was recognisable any longer. Dead bodies lay in his path. He could hear cries for help, but he ignored them. He was only able to save himself, and even that was looking uncertain. If only he knew where the nearest exit was. He had to find it before he suffocated or the fire reached him. Suddenly, his arms and legs gave way and he sprawled on his face. As blackness edged in, narrowing his vision, he understood it was all over for him. He was going to die and all his schemes and intrigues would come to nothing. The Britannic Alliance was going to remain a monarchy and there wasn't anything he could do about it. Then, like manna from heaven, a powerful jet of ice-cold water hit him. He shuddered at the sudden icy wetness, but he was jubilant. He might be saved yet. The fire service had finally arrived. But he was too exhausted and too stifled by smoke to halt his slide into unconsciousness. Just before darkness closed around him, he heard someone call out, The Queen! The Queen is dead! Chapter 15 The stairs to the top of Greer Orr's private tower curled in a spiral around its outer wall. She had no idea why the stone steps hadn't been built on the inside, sheltering the climber from the elements. The castle's origins were unknown, though she surmised it had to be at least 3,000 years old. Built during the age when stone edifices were the only protection from attack. Long, tedious wars had ravaged nations in those ancient times, a constant vying for land, wealth and power. As the Dwyer lifted the hem of her heavy gown and mounted the steps, she wondered if things had really changed that much in the intervening millennia. Perhaps it was only that fewer players participated in the great game now. The Britannic Alliance, the Antarctic Project and the Earth Awareness Crusade were the only major powers any more, and they all wanted the same thing. Control. She turned the first curve of the spiral, which brought her to the ocean-facing side of the tower. A dark sea churned before her, and the wind swept her river of black hair away from her face. At the horizon, the sky was lightning, fading out the stars in the east and gilding distant waves in the busy water. Touching the stone rail, she paused to take in the view, assessing the strength of light from the as yet invisible sun. She still had plenty of time. She continued to climb. No doubt each point in the triangle of powers that fought for Earth believed their cause to be just, she reflected. But at the same time she was confident the EAC was the only righteous one. Her order was the only organisation that held the planet herself in the heart of its doctrine. The living Earth was a sacred being, and she, with the help of her followers, intended to ensure its proper treatment in perpetuity. What cause could be more pure and noble? Unfortunately, along the way, sacrifices had to be made. 
Joining forces with Ur Talman meant temporarily allowing the AP's violation of the Earth's sanctity to continue. But if it meant that together they could put an end to the BA, it would be worth it. As long as she did penance, the imbalance would be redressed, and when Talman and his deluded disciples departed, the world would be whole once more and for eternity. When she'd nearly reached the door at the top of the tower, she halted her climb for a second time. Now she faced inland, where the castle's ramparts rose tall, wide and strong, surrounding the inner courtyard far below. Beyond the fortification, the green mountains of Westby Eye spread out as far as she could see, gaining colour at the approach of the sun. It was a beautiful land, and she was glad she had wrested it from the B.A.'s hands. Had the country remained under their government, they would have continued to exploit it, prioritising the needs of their citizens over everything else. Now she was its guardian, she would reassert the natural order. She climbed the final steps. The door to her sanctum at the top of the tower was never locked. Everyone who lived and worked in the castle knew that entry to anyone except herself was strictly forbidden. She grasped the iron ring at the door's edge, turned it, pushed open the heavy wooden door and stepped inside. The side of the tower wall that faced inland was solid stone. The other half, facing the ocean, consisted of stone struts between empty squares. The cold sea breeze blew strongly at the top of the tower. Carla's skin rose into goosebumps, despite the thickness of her robe. Propped against a wall was a short staff that had long, lithe silver birch twigs tied around one end. The young shoots had lost their fresh green shine and were coated brown. Carla unfastened the lacing at the front of her robe, loosening the tightness around her waist and hips and allowed the gown to drop to the floor. She stepped out from it, naked. Reaching down, she undid the laces of her shoes and pulled them off. The brown-stained, granite-tiled floor was icy beneath her bare feet. She began to shiver and her teeth chattered. She stepped to the birch switch and picked it up. After returning to the centre of the circular room, she moved her discarded clothing and knelt down on the cold floor, facing the sea. She pulled all her hair forward so that it spilled over her knees, leaving her back bare. From below came the sound of waves smashing into rocks, rhythmic and relentless. Clenching her teeth, she gripped the switch stoically and waited patiently for the edge of the sun to appear above the watery horizon. Earth slowly spun in space, bearing her toward the light of its star. Her body trembled and shook. Finally, she was rewarded with a sunbeam striking out over the ocean. A new day had begun. She raised the rod over her right shoulder and, with practised skill, struck her back with the whip-like twigs. This first strike made little impression against the tough, ridged scars. She would need to strike herself many times to break her skin, but break her skin she must. Earth required a blood sacrifice. The resources the AP ripped from it while allied with the EAC must be paid for in order to maintain the balance between humanity and its home. Carla struck her back again, harder this time. She moved the staff to her other shoulder and hit herself again. As she continued to work and the sun rose, she warmed up. The chilliness of her position didn't affect her any more. Sweat broke out on her face and neck and soddened her armpits. Her animal smell rose around her. She breathed it in, relishing her musk, which mixed with the smell of the sea. After ten or fifteen minutes, she was gratified to feel a trickle run down her back and over her buttocks. 
She was bleeding freely at last. When she knelt in a puddle of her own blood, she would stop. Then a scraping sound came from behind her, the sound of metal against metal. Someone was opening the door. She put down her flail and looked over her shoulder, ready to snap a reproof at the newcomer. Whoever it was would receive a severe punishment for disturbing her. The door opened, and a boy peered around it. Perrin. The adolescent's eyes stretched wide, and his pupils darkened as he took in the sight of her naked, bloody back. What are you doing, Mummy? Get out! She snapped. Who gave you permission to climb my tower? Get away from here! But he didn't move. His eyes only widened further, and his mouth hung open. Leave now, or I'll have you flogged. Perrin did begin to withdraw, but his gaze lingered on her, an inscrutable expression on his face. Out! He left, and the door closed. The iron catch swung shut. Vexed and irked that her son had witnessed her act of sacrifice, she continued with her task. But it was hard to fight the distraction. Instead of focusing on the rising sun and devotional thoughts as she should have, she found herself thinking of Perrin's conception and childhood. She didn't know who his earthly father was. Many men had come to her in the guise of the horned god that night in the oak grove, and Perrin's appearance gave no clue about his sire. He looked like a male version of herself. Not that his physical father mattered; he was hers and hers alone to raise in the ways of the crusade. When he matured to a man, a great role awaited him. Later. When her arms and back throbbed painfully, and her blood sat sticky around her knees, Carla stopped. Her penance completed, she rose from the floor and returned the dripping switch to its position next to the wall. She almost cried out as she put on her gown and the cloth contacted her open, dripping flesh, but she bit her lip. Complaining when she was the person who had the honour to make the sacrifice would be churlish. She slipped on her shoes and walked to the door. Turning the iron ring, she pulled it open and stepped out onto the stone stairway. Before she began to descend, she noticed something odd. Far below, within the castle's inner courtyard, the level of activity was far greater than usual. People were running about or congregating in the open space, as if to discuss an important event. She lifted her skirts and began to walk down the steps. When she'd nearly reached the bottom of the tower, the castle's bell began to toll, and faintly between the chimes, she heard the cry, "Queen Alice is dead." She halted. They'd done it. The EAC and AP's air fleet had broken through the Britannic Alliance's defences and sent the Queen to her grave. The blow to the BA's morale would be devastating. They had ripped the heart from their mutual enemy. Only one thing now stood in their way: one final achievement that would be the coup de grace. She had to find the man who had been taken from the mountain at Nant Gari Garth, just as her soldiers had been closing in on him. Did the BA know who he was? Did they even believe his existence was possible? She barely believed it herself. If the crusade were to succeed, he had to die. Chapter sixteen, Colburn was back. She'd arrived during the quiet shift, and for once, she hadn't summoned Wright to her office immediately. Instead, her calm requesting his presence had popped into his mind as soon as he woke. He wondered if she was becoming more considerate of others, but it turned out he was wrong. After the brigadier's summons came an urgent news report: the general council had been bombed, and along with other important figures. The Queen had been killed. 
He sat up in bed and rubbed his head. It was quite the news to wake up to. How on earth had it been possible to attack the General Council? Even if the time and location had been leaked, the Army and Navy would have set up heavy defences of the area. He checked the rest of the news report. It was believed the AP and the EAC had mounted a joint attack. So the two had joined forces? That spelled serious trouble for the BA. He got up and walked to his shower room. Poor Queen Alice. The old lady hadn't deserved to die in such a violent fashion. She'd been on the throne all his life and, as far as he knew, she'd never been anything but kind and gentle. He guessed Prince Frederick was now king and preparations for his coronation would be underway. Where would they hold it? If a bombing raid against the General Council in the heart of the BA's domain could succeed, was anywhere on earth safe any more? So much had changed within just a few hours. A second summons arrived from Colburn. You've been awake five minutes already, right? Where are you? He stood outside Colburn's office awaiting admittance. For all her impatience in demanding his attendance, she was being awfully slow at actually letting him in. He straightened his uniform jacket and shifted his weight to his other foot. After another full minute, the door finally slid open. Wright almost swore in surprise, but stopped himself just in time. He gawped at the scene inside as a medic pushed past him on her way out. The brigadier had been burned quite severely. One side of her face was red and blistered and half her hair had been singed away. Her skin glistened, wet with ointment. She was only partly dressed. Her shirt covered the right-hand side of her torso, but her left arm and chest were swathed in dressings, which the medic must have been applying or renewing while he waited. Close your mouth, man, and sit down. Wright snapped his jaw shut unaware it had fallen open. Ma'am, I had no idea. I'm very sorry. The withering look Colburn gave him made his words dry up. She didn't need or want his pity. He took a seat. I'm sure it's obvious we're in a serious situation, she said. The Valiant and her corvettes are to mobilise battle ready within the next three hours. I haven't received the coordinates yet, but we must go as soon as they arrive. Understood, Mum. You don't need to do anything right now. I've already given the orders. I wanted to talk to you about something else. He waited, but she didn't speak immediately. Some emotion seemed to come over her. Sorrow? Regret? He couldn't tell. She lost her usual steely look and suddenly appeared tired and older, as if the inner strength and resolve that had kept her going for years was weakening. She passed a hand over her forehead and gasped in pain as she accidentally touched her seared skin. Finally, she seemed to decide what she wanted to say. Right, I'll speak plainly. As things stand at the moment, we're screwed. It was not the kind of thing he expected to hear from the brigadier. In the years she'd been his CO, she'd never been anything except positive and determined. The woman was the exact opposite of a quitter. At times, he'd suspected she would fight off death himself when he finally came calling. I... I'm sorry, ma'am? That's twice you've apologised to me for no reason. If you do it once more, I'll have you thrown in the brig. So... He sealed his lips. Colburn gingerly rearranged herself slightly in her chair, as if to try to get more comfortable, wincing as she moved. You're too young to remember how things used to be, Major. When I first entered the Royal Marines as an officer cadet, the BA was at the peak of its power. We'd been successfully rooting out and putting a stop to AP activities for years, preventing damage to ecosystems and helping to preserve Earth's resources. Other nations lived in security because of us and, for the most part, 
The planet was a safe and pleasant place. The EAC was only a fledgling organisation, one that at the time was believed to be a force for good. We welcomed it with open arms. I learned about it at school, said Wright, wondering where the brigadier was going. This was history. He wasn't sure what it had to do with what was happening now. Then the EAC's true agenda was revealed after it had begun to weaken the BA. Then we threw them out and... Colburn was shaking her head. That's the story the politicians love to tell and that's what they demand goes down in the history books. But the truth is the rise of the EAC isn't to blame for the BA's changing fortunes. The rot had already begun from within and the EAC only exploited the opportunity. If the BA had been a solid, ethical, incorruptible entity, the EAC would never have been able to get a foothold. But they saw the infighting, petty jealousies, the machinations and intrigues, and they found it easy to pit us against each other. Military branch against military branch, politician against politician, business sector against business sector. When the army and the navy don't work together, battles are lost. When politicians refuse to agree on anything, economies and the citizens' well-being suffer. When business sectors undermine each other, corporations collapse. She paused and turned to the motto framed on the wall behind her. She read it out quietly, as if talking to herself. Per mare, per terum, per astra. By sea, by land, by the stars. Returning her attention to right, she said, It was even true within the ranks of the Royal Marines, and it still is. I may be a bad-tempered, crotchety old bitch, but if you knew the decades of bullshit I've endured, you'd understand why. She spared him an almost indiscernible smile. He didn't bother to deny her description of herself. The brigadier was certainly not fishing for compliments. The attack on the general council has probably come as a shock to you, but I've been expecting it for years. Every few months there's a new defeat, another small territory lost. The assault at the heart of BA territory and the murder of Queen Alice are just more nails in the coffin. I don't know what the answer is. It seems things have gone too far and there's nothing anyone can do to stop it. I've been trying not to dwell on the truth, but my injury has brought my mortality into painful relief. I thought, while I still can, I should let you know the true state of things. She was silent, but for once... She didn't seem intent on kicking him out of her office and off to work as soon as humanly possible. He took advantage of her unusual frame of mind to properly digest what she'd said. The more he thought about it, the more he understood the severity of the situation. The brigadier was the last person who would openly state the BA's total defeat was likely. If she was telling him this... Was there any hope at all? What you do about it is up to you, Colburn said finally. I've decided I'm going to stick it out to the end. But you're still young and none of this is your fault. I don't see why people like you should become cannon fodder for the incompetence above you. What do you think the future holds, he asked in reflex. She seemed to be suggesting that he got out before everything fell apart but what would he do? Where would he go? He couldn't imagine a life outside of military service. The brigadier had thrown him a spin ball and he didn't know what to do with it. Honestly, I think, with the help of the AP, the EAC will wipe us off the map. It will seize every last scrap of BA soil and water on Earth and all our space territories. Then... If the AP's colony ships aren't completed in time for them to escape, the crusade will turn on them and destroy them too. 
After that, all humanity will be forced to live under the odious cult, gradually devolving into barbarism, cannibalism, and who knows what else, until we're back to grunting at each other while we hunt with spears. Within a single lifespan, thousands of years of human civilization will be gone. You don't paint a very pretty picture. There's no point in sugar-coating it, Major. There has to be something we can do. I used to believe so, but now I'm not sure there is. Perhaps what's happening is inevitable. Perhaps there's something about the human species that prevents it from ever truly overcoming its instinct to destroy and kill. Perhaps we have always been and will ever be doomed. Chapter 17 A batcher snoring in his rack above her, the ship's cat, Boots, transplanted from the daisy, curling at her feet, and the farting, heavy rhythmic breathing and mumbled words of marines talking in their sleep told Talon she was the only one awake in the cabin. She pushed her hand between her mattress and bed frame and took out her interface. Electronics after lights out was strictly forbidden, but she didn't give a shit any more. The Valiant was mobilising, and her already slim chances of returning to West B.I. were gone. She would have to remain in military service and fight when she could have been. She opened her device, turned down the brightness and navigated the familiar, well-trodden digital path to the vids buried in her files. After escaping to Ireland, she'd only managed to retrieve a small amount of her personal data from the lifetime's worth she had in her cloud before the EAC blew the banks on BI, thus destroying most records of her life, along with quadrillions of more items of private, governmental and corporate information. She usually viewed the few vids she had remaining in chronological order. It had always seemed the best way to try to make sense of everything that had happened, but in truth it never really worked. This time, instead of going automatically to her earliest recording made when she was a child, she picked the last one, created just before she'd fled the BI and enlisted with the Royal Marines. She tapped the screen, connecting the vid to her implanted comm so only she would hear the audio, rested her head on her pillow and watched. She'd begun recording just before the attack, clipping her small interface to the front of her jacket. Why exactly she'd decided to capture that moment, she didn't know. Maybe, somehow, she'd foreseen what would happen. A brilliant green hillside. It was raining, the raindrops on the screen distorting the picture. The scene jerked up and down as she ran, but then her pace had slowed. She turned, looking back. Behind her ran the slower of her neighbours, the old, the young, the sick, the disabled. Beyond them, over the rise, came EAC troops, firing. Pivoting forward again, she'd raced on. Her emotions from the time swept over her, as if she were there again. Fear she and her family would die. Guilt that she couldn't do anything to help the others, her friends, her neighbours. She had no weapon, and even if she had, stopping to fight off the invaders would put her children in more danger. Through the rain, the object of her flight appeared. At the base of the hill, an old farmhouse huddled, and a narrow ribbon of grey road wound away from it across the landscape. If they could reach the building, they had a chance of escaping. Suddenly, a chubby pink knee blocked Camera's view. Kayla. Talon gripped her interface tighter. A scream! One of the villagers had been hit. The EAC were within firing range. They would pick them off, shooting the slowest runners first, gradually catching up to them and shooting more and more until no one was left. The EAC took no prisoners. 
they were not interested in the natives of any area they stole. Anyone who wasn't in their cult was impure and beyond redemption. They wanted only the land for their own people. It had become a race to the death. A second scream. This one went on for long seconds until it abruptly cut off. The knee blocking the view moved as Talon shifted her daughter to her other hip. As she did so, her jacket swung and her interface caught a glimpse of Patrin running ahead. He'd always been fast, beating all the other boys his age at school. The farmhouse had moved closer. She recalled her terror, wondering if they would make it. The bumping, lurching, recording picked up movement at the door to the farmhouse. It had opened and figures were emerging. For a few terrifying heartbeats, she'd thought they were EAC troops, the house already in enemy hands, and they were coming out to attack from the opposite side. She, her children and the rest of her village would be slaughtered. But they were not. The men and women now running toward them were Westby Eye Resistance. They were coming to their rescue. For some, it was already too late. As the resistance fighters were speeding up the hill toward them, more shouts of pain and agony came from the rear. Talon thought she recognised the voices, but she didn't dare take the time to look around and see who had fallen. She only had to make it to the farmhouse, or, failing that, if she was hit, she could cover Kayla with her body. Maybe the resistance fighters would find her later. Patrin would make it on his own. He was nearly in the lead, despite his young years. He would make it. He had to make it. The resistance was forking into groups and swinging out, probably intending to attack the EAC from each side to avoid catching the villagers in crossfire. A handful continued to run directly ahead. The recording continued another half a minute as she'd run on, dashing through the long, wet grass, fearful of tripping. A misstep could be the death of her and her daughter. One of the fighters had reached Patrin. The woman spurred the exhausted boy on and called out to the other villagers to run, that there were transports at the farmhouse ready to take them somewhere safe. Then the heavens seemed to open, and what had been an annoying drizzle became a downpour. The recording at this point was nothing more than a blur of moving colours, the sound of the pelting rain mixed with the shouting and yells of pain. She remembered the water blinding her and turning the hillside into a river. Though she'd barely been able to see, she hadn't slackened her pace. She knew where the house sat. All she had to do was get there. So it was that she blindly ran directly into a fighter coming from the other direction. They bounced off each other, then both hit the ground and tumbled down the slope. Clutching her screaming daughter, she protected Carla's head with one hand until she came to a stop. When she stood up, she was nearly at the refuge. The low stone wall marking the boundary of the farmyard was only metres away. When she couldn't see Patrin, she assumed he was already inside and hopefully being loaded into one of the trucks to make an escape. Behind, up on the hill, the villagers were streaming down like the rain pelting from the heavens and the fighters were engaging with the EAC troops. The man she'd collided with was rising to his feet, but as he did so, he cried out and collapsed. Talon ran over to him. I'm so sorry. Are you OK? The fighter couldn't answer. He only gripped his knee and gasped and grimaced in pain. He must have dislocated his knee or broken a bone. Can you get up? Let me help you inside. The man still didn't answer, but he lifted his arm and she helped him to his feet. Her child on one hip and the resistance member's arm over her shoulder, she slowly walked to the farmhouse entrance. An old woman was waiting there. The minute she saw Kayla, she beckoned. We have a transport ready to go. We're taking all the mothers and children first. Is that where my son has gone? asked Talon, helping the fighter hobble through the doorway. The little boy, about seven years old? He's six, but yes, he's already on board. Hurry, there isn't much time. 
The resistance fighter slid onto a nearby chair. He was pale and sweaty, and blood was seeping through his pants leg. Her neighbours were arriving at the farmhouse and flooding into it. Out on the hillside, the fighting had begun in earnest. Talon looked at the man she'd accidentally injured. The West B.I. resistance was one person down, and it was her fault. Do you know where the children are going? she asked the woman. A safe house. From there they'll travel to Anglesey and then sail to Dublin. She clenched her jaw, indecision hounding her. Mummy, said Kayla, patting her face. Suddenly, Talon held out her daughter to the old woman. Take her to the truck. You go with her. Kayla cried and struggled, trying to get back onto Talon's hip. What? the woman said. No, I can't do that. You must go with your child. Please, I'm able-bodied and fit. I should fight. I want to help stop the EAC reaching the transports. I can make a difference. I know I can. Please, take her. With a look of reluctance, the woman took Kayla into her arms. The little girl screamed. Talon stooped down and slid the injured man's weapon from his shoulder. He was in too much pain to protest. The old woman hadn't moved. Please, go, Talon repeated loudly over the sound of her daughter's wailing. Look after my kids. Their names are Kayla and Patrin. I'll follow later. The woman nodded and carried Kayla away, only holding on to the yelling, struggling child with some difficulty. Talon forced her way against the tide of incoming people and out into the rain. Little chick. The screen blacked out. The recording ended. Her interface had been hit by a stray pulse round, saving her life. The device had been a total loss, but its automatic upload to her cloud meant the recording had survived. Little chick. Talon looked up, dragged away from the farmhouse in West B.I. and the green hillside, and the pouring rain, and returned to the valiant, her new life, and the silent, dark cabin. You shouldn't watch those vids, said a batcher. They only make you sad. He was leaning down from his bunk, though she could only just make him out. She wiped the wetness from her face. Without replying to her friend, she turned off the interface and slid it between her mattress and the bed frame. And no more picking fights with the knuckle-draggers, OK? he said. I don't like lying for you, especially not to a good guy like Wright. And my head's not so hard that it can take all the punishment it gets trying to defend you. I don't need your help. A batch aside and lay down, making the bed springs creak. Chapter 18 the Caribbean island of Antigua was an emerald in a sapphire sea, heaving into view as the shuttle banked. According to Dwyer Orr, while fighting on Barbados continued, Antigua was safely in the hands of the combined EAC and AP forces. The island had been the first to fall, succumbing to EAC landing forces in an operation that incurred little damage. Lorcan was glad. With his infrastructure intact, harvesting Antigua's resources would be all the easier. But he doubted he would have time to pay the place a visit. He had more important business to attend to, and he didn't like spending time away from his shipbuilding sites. He simply couldn't trust the nincompoops working for him not to cock something up in his absence. The shuttle evened out as it dipped lower. White caps on the waves below became visible under the brilliant blue sky. Lorcan lowered the armrests on each side of his seat. His private space air vessel held four passenger seats, but, as usual, the rest were empty. He couldn't recall the last time he'd had company on a trip, for business or the rare recreational jaunt he allowed himself. He'd preferred things that way for a long time though he couldn't deny that a woman like Dwyer Orr might be a pleasant occasional ornament. 
Prepare to submerge, sir, said the pilot over the intercom. He fastened his seat belt. The shuttle slowed and its nose dipped. The moment of passing from air to water was a critical one. The speed and angle had to be such that the vessel's buoyancy was counteracted, allowing it to plunge into the ocean without damaging its structural integrity. The ship's computer would do the hard work, but the pilot was trained to perform the manoeuvre manually, if necessary. The man was one of the very few people Lorcan trusted with his life, and he was well compensated for it. Additionally, when the day of departure came, the pilot and his family's sleep capsules on the Brez would be guaranteed. It was the main motivator of every one of his vast team, he guessed. Each had their own motivation, but they all wanted to come along. The stomach-lurching impact hit, forcing him sharply forward. Outside his window, water appeared to boil. The cabin darkened and echoes of churning sea infiltrated it. Internal and external lights came on simultaneously. The shuttle levelled and he relaxed and unclipped his seatbelt. The journey to the seabed would take another half an hour. Boredom was already nagging at him. He opened a slot on his armrest and pulled out an earbud, which he popped into his right ear before selecting a report from Kakoa on the screen in the opposite armrest. Closing his eyes, he relaxed in his seat and listened. The report began with a summary of Kakoa's latest work on Brez's habitats, specifically mentioning the installation of wind machines at West Lake. He smiled. She was trying to find favour but she still wouldn't receive her docked credits. He couldn't afford to allow any of them to get sloppy. As Kakoa's voice droned on, drowsiness crept up on him. The monotonous rendition of the report seemed to fade while the drone of the shuttle's engine grew louder, and he felt himself slipping away into slumber. He didn't fight it. A nap would pass the time. He was in his private suite, sipping champagne with Dwyer Orr. She didn't speak as she sat facing him, her glass in her hand, only watching him with her dark eyes, an amused expression on her face. He wasn't sure what she found amusing, but he was not offended. She put down her glass and, without a word, began to untie the laced cords at her bosom. He choked in surprise. Then he tried to speak, to protest, but his tongue and lips would not obey him. He tried to stand and move away, but he couldn't. It was as if an invisible heavy blanket was weighing his body down. The dwyer slipped her gown from her shoulders, exposing her naked flesh. Lorcan didn't want to look, but he couldn't help himself. Animal desire welled up in him, mixed with outrage and shame. His lungs laboured as he desperately sought an exit from the situation. She moved closer. He caught her scent. It was a strange odour, reminding him of wood smoke mixed with roses. The odd perfume only increased his hunger for her. She leaned in, turning her head so their lips... Lorcan jerked awake, panting and wet with sweat. His dream receded, and the audio of Kokoa's report surged louder. Somehow, the cabin looked unfamiliar and otherworldly, though it was identical to how it had been before he'd fallen asleep. He roughly pulled out the earbud and sat up. Uncomfortable prickles ran across his skin. Was someone watching him? It was impossible. Apart from the pilot, in his separate cabin, he was alone. Outside, the water was empty, and beyond the range of the shuttle's beams, dark. Why did he feel he was being observed? Five minutes to arrival, sir, said the pilot. Lorcan wiped his face and then pressed the button to retract the earbud into its slot. He needed to compose himself. He drew in a deep breath and exhaled, focusing his mind on his visit. Why had he dreamed that scenario? 
It had felt so real. The shuttle's speed had slowed almost to a stop. Beyond the window sat the opening to an underwater bay. The pilot eased the vessel another few metres forward into the bay before shutting off the engines. Lorcan waited for the small impact as the shuttle hit the buffer. After the bounce, the bay's pumps started up and the water drained out. Gradually, the vessel dropped lower until it rested on the bay floor. He got out of his seat and went to the hatch. The pilot was there before him and already opening it. Outside, the site's chief engineer and coordinator, Khan, was already waiting, standing at the other end of the ramp that led out of the bay. It's good to see you, sir, he nodded and stepped onto the ridged metal plate. Small sea creatures flopped and crawled on the floor as he walked up the ramp to the exit. The scent of the ocean was strong. All operations are ready for your inspection, said Khan. The workers are keen to show you the results of their hard work. Lorcan grunted a non-committal reply. He didn't want to waste time touring the station itself. He'd seen enough living quarters and admin departments to last a lifetime. So he told her he wanted to go to the mine site, directly and immediately. Oh, yes, of course, she replied, looking surprised. Well, we're in the right place. We can take a submersible from the next bay over. She led him to the adjacent hatch and thumbed a security code into the panel. There was the sound of metal locks releasing and Khan turned the wheel. Swinging the hatch open, she stooped and stepped through onto a second ramp before walking down to a small submersible. The walls and floor in here were dry and the ocean wildlife that had made its way inside was long dead. A horrible rotting smell pervaded the place. Lorcan lifted his upper lip. How often is the site visually inspected? he asked. Twice daily. We don't usually use this submersible. It's a reserve as it's only a two-seater. Lorcan acknowledged her explanation with a second grunt. The Barracuda Ridge Mine spanned 15 kilometres of seabed and it was the Antarctic project's most productive source of gold, copper and cobalt. Up until the successful EAC AP attack on the Britannic Alliance's Caribbean territory, the site had been forced to perform its operations in secrecy and Lorcan had resented the additional expense this entailed. Now there was no need for subterfuge. The BA had its hands full defending the islands it continued to hold, for the time being. As Khan piloted the narrow craft through the dark water, she didn't speak, apparently quick to catch on to his dislike of unnecessary chatter. He liked that the woman was a fast learner. The hum of the engine was the only sound. Above the transparent submersible's hull, the black ocean passed by. At this depth, no light penetrated from the surface. Below, a sandy seabed was dimly revealed by the vessel's lights. Lorcan saw crabs and dead fish being devoured by worms. Many fronded plants or animals sprouted in patches, colourless and gently moving in the current. He stole a sidelong glance at Khan. For her level of seniority, she seemed young. She was attractive, mahogany-skinned and black-haired. His mind began travelling along a certain line of thought, but he caught himself, sickened. He deliberately diverted his attention to the view ahead. It was Dweer Orr's fault. Firstly, her overly flirtatious behaviour when she'd come to see him, and, secondly, the dream he'd had. Though it seemed unfair to blame her for the wanderings of his subconscious, he couldn't help but feel she was somehow responsible. We're getting close, said Khan. Can you see? Just over there. She indicated with her gaze, keeping her hands on the submersible's controls. He picked out the lights in the darkness, fuzzy and shifting, as if beyond the heat shimmer above a road on a hot day. Why do the extractor's lights look like that? he asked. Is it the ocean currents? No, 
Some hydrothermal vents stand between us and the main operation. Ah, I see. He'd known about the vents. Seawater, superheated through contact with tectonic subduction zones, spurted from them, but didn't boil due to the pressure at that depth. They were rich with minerals and the entire reason for the mining operation, but he'd never set eyes on them before. The submersible drew closer to the natural undersea structures and he began to make out their tall, columnar forms, the funnels of the intensely hot water. The submersible's lights brought out their vivid colours, garish and artificial-looking in the seascape. They're quite spectacular, aren't they? commented Khan. I would take us in to give you a better look, but it's dangerous to get too close. No, this is enough. Lorcan gazed at the strange phenomena. They looked like something he might expect to see on an alien planet one day, yet here they were on Earth. In a way, Khan said, it's a pity we have to destroy them to extract the ore. A pity? He turned to her in annoyance. It isn't a pity at all. I concede they may be rather pretty, but they're a resource, and resources are there to be exploited. What's the point of them sitting there for hundreds of thousands of years, no use to anyone? Eventually, at the encroachment of our bloated sun, even these vents will crumble and disperse to dust. What will be the point of them then? Much better to put them to a practical purpose for the furtherment of humanity and move on. The galaxy is there for us, and us alone, Khan. Remember that? I don't like my staff getting sentimental. Looking suitably abashed at his admonishment, the chief engineer piloted their machine onward in silence, taking a route that avoided the vents. Throughout his inspection of the mining site and the rest of his visit, her mood remained subdued, but Lorcan didn't pay her any mind. Overall, he was pleased with what he saw, and before he left to return to the Brez, he asked Khan to formulate plans to double the Barracuda's production and to liaise with his prospecting team to seek out new potential deep-sea mining sites. His regular mines in China were costing him more and more to run each year, yet producing less and less ore. If he could recreate Barracuda's success elsewhere, he might be able to bring forward the completion of the project by several months. Chapter 19 He has to come off sedation immediately, said Colburn. He must be ambulatory in case we're attacked. I can't have my medics wasting their time moving a perfectly fit and healthy man. But are you questioning my order, Major? Of course not. Wright inwardly sighed. Colburn hadn't been around when the man he'd rescued had woken up. She hadn't seen him go berserk, or the effort it had taken to subdue him. Knowing the brigadier, she would also most likely refuse to view the security vid. She was the kind of officer who knew no middle ground, which made her very good and very bad at her job. Medic! Colburn barked. A uh, doctor, actually, corrected the duty doc the same person who had told Wright about the patient waking up. Cease sedation on this patient, Colburn continued, without acknowledging her mistake. Gladly, said the doctor. I think it's for the best, she added, to Wright. We can't keep him under forever. She leaned over the miraculous mummy-turned living human being and closed the valve on the drip that was running into his hand. Next, she gently pulled out the cannula and puffed a spray on the insertion point, instantly drying up the blood leaking out. He should be awake in an hour or so. That's that, said Colburn, with an air of finality. I'll be in my office, she said, exiting the sick bay. Right grimaced. That was not that, not by a long shot, if his previous experience of the wakened patient was anything to go by. I guess I'd better leave the restraints on, said the doc. The man was now dressed in a hospital gown and lying under a sheet. He continued to look remarkably healthy and his hair and beard had been growing incredibly fast, 
now a couple of centimetres longer than when the Major had seen him a few days ago. Yes, leave them on, he said, and let me know as soon as he begins to come around. With a sense of foreboding, he walked out of the bay and headed toward one of the Valiant's gyms. Ellis was due to provide support for the first time at a training session and he wanted to observe her. The corporal was another problem pressing on his mind. She was clearly troubled and while he usually avoided getting too involved in the day-to-day -day lives of the Marines, she was a special case. She was an exceptional combatant and in the coming war against the joined EAC and AP forces they would need every edge they had. He took the elevator outside the gym to the second level and walked out onto the gallery. Resting his elbows on the railing, he looked down. The session had already begun. The instructor was explaining a move that could be deployed when attacked from behind. The man asked Ellis to step forward and take part in a demonstration. She got up from her spot on the mat with the trainees and as she walked over to the instructor, she happened to glance up. She registered right watching. She gave him a sullen look. What was the woman's problem? After halting at the instructor's side, she turned to face the watching men and women, her legs standing apart and her hands held loosely together behind her back. Another participant was called, a burly male marine who stood a head taller than Ellis, who was above average height herself and about twice as wide. He swaggered toward her, grinning. She remained stony-faced, not even looking at him. Right sense of foreboding over the waking patient transferred to the young corporal. She was excellent at combat, but the man the training sergeant had set her up against was a giant. If the Marine didn't hold back, Ellis was in danger of getting seriously hurt. What was the trainer doing? Was he trying to prove a point? Did he resent being told to use Ellis as support for his sessions? Wright recalled the first time he'd seen her at the briefing session for the rescue mission. He'd sensed that other Marines didn't like her then. And there had been that fight in the cabin. The corporal had never stated she didn't start it. Was Ellis universally disliked except for that other Marine, a batcher, who she'd requested to be transferred with her to the Valiant. The instructor told her to stand with her back to the large marine. She swivelled around and let her arms hang loose at their sides. The instructor stepped backward and then nodded at her would-be attacker. The marine immediately ran at her, but before he reached her she dropped like a stone into a squat, causing him to overbalance as his hands swiped empty air. Reaching above and behind her, she grabbed his hips and tugged him the rest of the way over her, so he ended up sprawling on the mat. She was on him in a split second, driving her fist into his stomach. Wright heard the thud of impact and the explosive groan from the victim even away up in the gallery. Ellis was pulling her arm back for a second punch when the instructor reached her and grabbed it. She wrenched her arm from him and leapt up, furious, the marine she'd felled rolled onto his side, clutching his stomach. That was not the move I'm teaching, corporal! The instructor's angry voice echoed around the gym. It was the best move in the circumstances. I used his weight against him. That's what you should... How the hell are you supposed to guess the weight of an attack you can't see? But I did see him! She got up in the sergeant's face and poked his chest. Anger and outrage drained the colour from the man's face, but that didn't stop her. If you want Ellis, stand down, Wright yelled from the gallery. Everyone's gazes turned to him, many looking surprised as if they were noticing him for the first time. Wait for me outside, Corporal, he ordered. In the privacy of the elevator, as it descended to the first level of the gym, he cursed, all concerned for Ellis's well-being gone. He had enough on his plate without dealing with undisciplined, hot-headed non-coms. She was leaning against the bulkhead in the passageway, her arms folded. As he approached, she stood to half-hearted attention. My office, he said, and set off, 
not checking if she was following. He felt like he'd finally seen the real Ellis. This was why no one liked her. She was arrogant and refused to follow orders. Maybe it would have been better to allow her to resign. It didn't matter how proficient she was. If she wouldn't work with the others, she would be a burden and a risk, especially now things were hotting up. But when they'd nearly reached his room, a comm arrived from the sick bay duty dock. Could you come over here, Major? she asked. We have a bit of a situation. Don't tell me. The mummy's awake. Yes, the sedation wore off faster than I thought it would and the comm cut off. Shit, that was close, the doc continued a second later. Please, come as fast as you can. Security can't hold him. I'm on my way, Wright replied. But what to do with Ellis? Come with me, he said. He ran in the direction of the sick bay, the corporal at his side. It sounded like the doc had removed the bed restraints for some reason. That seemed odd, considering she'd been a first-hand witness to the patient's violence. The noise of the disturbance reverberated down the passageway. Crashing, clanging, shouting and the roaring of the patient was coming from the sick bay. Wright pushed open the door on a scene of chaos. Medical equipment was scattered over the floor, beds were askew, and in the middle of it all was the wakened man. The doc hadn't removed his restraints. He was still strapped to his bed. One restraint, the one holding an ankle, had broken, and somehow the man had managed to get to his feet. His bed held firm to his back by the remaining restraints. He was swinging it around, smashing into anything and everything nearby. His face was contorted and red, and his eyes were wild. The two security officers and the doc stood in a corner, having given up on trying to approach him. One of the officers was holding his hand to a gash on his face. Hey! Hey! Wright yelled and clapped his hands to attract the man's attention. He turned crazed eyes to the Major and paused momentarily, but then continued to struggle and rage. Wright realised he wasn't actually trying to hurt anyone this time. He was trying to free himself. Should I sedate him again? called the doctor from her corner. Colburn would be furious if her orders were countermanded. No, not yet. But what else could they do? The man had already caused a huge amount of damage to the sick bay. If they didn't get him under control, the place and equipment would be wrecked and the patient could hurt himself. Suddenly, the patient lunged at him, possibly aiming for the exit. Wright darted out of the way. He looked around for something he could use to force him away from the door. He doubted the man would get through it with a bed on his back, but he couldn't take the risk of a crazed sick bay escapee roaming the passageways. Get away from there, shouted Wright. But if the man heard him, he took no notice. He ran at the door. The top of the bed caught on the frame and he bounced back, staggering and yelling. Then, as if the situation wasn't insane enough, Wright heard the sound of singing coming from his left. It was Ellis. The corporal was standing nearby, her chin tilted up, singing in a language Wright didn't recognise. He stared, his mouth agape. What on earth was she doing? As he watched, she briefly paused, filled her chest and sang louder. He realised the commotion from the patient had stopped. Ellis was looking at the man as she sang, holding his gaze with her own. He seemed entranced. His expression softened, his breathing slowed, and the knotted muscles of his neck and arms relaxed. Ellis stopped singing. She walked to the calmer patient, who swayed slightly. Touching his cheek, she spoke softly, again using the foreign language. The man replied. It was the first time Wright had heard him utter something other than a roar of rage and confusion. Ellis shook her head and then continued speaking to him. The doctor and security guards ventured from their corner. One of the guards marched toward the patient, holding a set of handcuffs, but Wright frowned at him and shook his head. 
He figured trying to lock the man up now would only send him into another episode of rage. The doctor began straightening the beds that had been knocked askew. Meanwhile, Ellis kept on talking to the patient, who watched her steadily. After a little while, she turned to Wright and said, I think he's calmed down now. We can take off the restraints. Chapter 20 Try as he might, Hans could remember nothing of his rescue from the bombing of the General Council meeting or the evacuation flight out of Barbados. He hadn't been able to glean much information from the vid news channels either. The government was undoubtedly limiting media coverage of what had happened, hoping to avoid panic. All he knew was that the Alliance was fighting to hold on to the outer Caribbean islands, and if it failed, then he would have to be evacuated again, out of the Kingston Hospital in Jamaica to a safer BA-held territory. As time went on, such places were becoming fewer. He reached for the interface screen on its extendable arm and turned it off before pushing the device away from his bed. He pressed a button to request assistance. When will I be discharged? he asked the nurse, who appeared a few moments later. You're doing well, Mr Jonty, the man replied. Your blood oxygen is almost back to normal. He stepped to Hans's bedside and peered at the display screen on the wall. Still, it won't hurt to have another puff of this. He removed Hans's nasal cannula and replaced it with a mask that covered his mouth and nose. The mask was attached to a nebulizer, and as the moist, medicated air filtered through, Hans's breathing became easier and less painful. I said, he repeated, when can I expect to be discharged? The nurse pulled the mask away from his face. What was that? How much longer am I to stay here? I have important work to do, especially now we have this crisis. I'm sorry, I don't know. Not for a few days, I expect. Your wounds still require twice daily dressing. If you're discharged too early, they could become infected, and then we would have to admit you again. He released the mask over Hans's face, but Hans caught it and held it. I can't wait a few days. I have to... Never mind. There was no point in arguing with the nurse. He would have to discharge himself, regardless of medical advice. He loathed lying impotently in a hospital bed while others turned the gears of the Britannic Alliance. Whatever you say. The nurse fiddled with the display over the bedhead. Can I get you anything? No. The nurse waited another few minutes, fiddling with the bed and the display, before removing the nebulizer. Dinner's in half an hour, he said, on his way out. Someone will be in to dress your wounds this evening. As he opened the door, he halted. Oh, hello. Someone on the other side spoke, but Hans couldn't make out the words. Yes, until 7.30, replied the nurse. Then visiting hours are over. He held open the door. When Hans saw who entered, he sat bolt upright. Josephine! I thought you were... I mean, I thought... The woman smiled sadly and shook her head as she crossed the room to his bed. She waited until the nurse left before saying, My name isn't Josephine. Josie was my twin. I'm Maria. I see. He realised he sounded disappointed. He was disappointed. His deceased assistant's resourcefulness had only been revealed just before she died. I'm very sorry for your loss, he added, hoping to turn his tone of regret into sadness. Thank you, said Maria, pulling over a chair and sitting down. She was dressed in the colourful clothes of the islands, including a banana yellow wrap around her hair. Her resemblance to her sister was remarkable, even for a twin. Usually adult twins could be told apart, but this woman was Josephine's mirror image. Hans wondered why she'd come to see him. Someone will have cleared out Josephine's office. Her personal items should have been shipped to I'm not here about Josie's things, said Maria softly. Ah, 
he was at a loss. Much as he enjoyed manipulating other people, their emotions always made him uncomfortable. No, I have another reason for visiting you, Mr. Jonter. She regarded him steadily. I've given it a lot of thought. Josie was very happy in her job. She felt she was doing something worthwhile, something to be proud of, and I... And I would like to take her place. You want to be my assistant? I'm afraid. We attended the same university, took the same courses. I'm equally qualified. I'm sure your qualifications are excellent. However, there are many more examinations and assessments to pass in order to join SIS, and these all take time. I can refer you to our applications section. I understand things must be difficult for your family right now, but stepping directly into your sister's shoes is out of the question. Mr. Jonter, I know how bureaucracy works. Do you have anyone ready to take Josie's place today, tomorrow? Or will you have to wait for a suitable person to be appointed? Do you really want to wait two or three weeks for someone to assist you in doing your job? I doubt I would have to wait two or three weeks. But she did have a point. He was feeling the lack of a personal assistant already, and he'd heard nothing from his department about his new one. All our lives, Maria said. Everyone who knew my sister and I commented on how alike we were, not only in appearance, but also in personality and capabilities. I'm sure you found Josie more than capable, didn't you? I can't deny it. In fact, I think I underestimated her. Most people did. Would it hurt to give me a chance? We could have a trial period of, say, a month. If after that you aren't satisfied with my work, then I'll leave. No hard feelings. May I ask why you're so determined to step into your twin shoes? Maria looked down. I miss her. I don't know if you have any siblings you're close to, but it was like she was part of me. I feel as though I've had an amputation. I think if I were to do her job, it would help me feel closer to her, to ease the pain. Not only that, we're at war, and though the vid news doesn't say it in so many words, we seem to be losing. I want to do what I can to help. I feel it's my duty. Her reasoning made perfect sense. And it was fortuitous that, just as he was ruining the loss of his assistant, another seemingly nearly identical person had stepped into the gap. He didn't believe in airy-fairy mumbo-jumbo of the type the EAC loved, but he found the serendipity of Maria's unexpected arrival hard to resist. Though he'd had no idea his deceased assistant had a twin, he'd never inquired about her family, there was no denying Maria was Josephine's sister. He had the evidence of his eyes to attest to it, and the background and security checks could be carried out while she was in position. He only had to be careful not to allow her access to highly sensitive information. Very well. You've persuaded me. We'll do a month's trial and then look toward a permanent position, providing you pass the security checks. Thank you, Mr. Jonta. Maria said, looking up at him with shining eyes. You won't regret it. There's no need to thank me. He had a burst of inspiration about what would be just the right thing to say. It'll be a nice way to honour Josephine's memory. After the first month's trial, there will be a standard six months probation. I know. Josie told me all about it. She loved her job, loved working for you. And I'm sure I will too. We'll have to see about that. I may be harder to work for than you imagine. I don't mind hard work, and I've always been interested in working in intelligence. Good. The first thing you can do for me is help me get out of here. I'll need some clothes and... His interface buzzed. He swung the screen around and opened the comm. A contact he had working within Parliament had sent it. When he scanned the message... He was outraged. 
Did the ministers think they could slip this past him just because he happened to be recovering from the bombing? Why hadn't he been invited? I need those clothes right away, Maria, he said, and have an auto cab waiting for me outside the hospital. The government's calling an emergency meeting I cannot miss. I'm on it, Mr. Jonta. Chapter 21 Absent mindedly juggling, Lorcan paced up and down his suite aboard the Brez. Coordinating the project single handed took considerable concentration, and his hobby helped him to think. It always took him a few minutes of deep thought to bring all the many important details to mind and mentally slot each part into place in the massive scheme. But just as he achieved the required depth of focus, his door chimed. The carefully held pieces of the gigantic puzzle of the project slipped from his hands and scattered into the ether. Damn it! Open, he said through clenched teeth. Kakoa was the person who had the misfortune to interrupt him. I'm sorry, sir, she blurted as soon as she saw him. There's a reason my commies turned off. I said no interruptions. We're aware of that, but... She gave a soft whimper as the ball Lorcan threw at her hit the middle of her forehead. We've received a message we thought you would want to hear immediately. He guessed the others had coerced her into the role of disturbing him since she was already in his bad books. And... Um, Kakoa swallowed. What is it? It's from Dwyer Orsa. She's requesting to meet with you urgently, in person. Is that all? In that case, show her in. She, she isn't here, sir. She wants you to see her at her residence. In B.I.? But I've only just got back from... Hell, all right. You've told me. Now go, before I dock your wages again. Kakoa retreated. Damn the dweer. His trip to the Barracuda mine had taken days of precious time. Yet could he refuse the request? The campaign against the Britannic Alliance was going well, but they needed to discuss their next move. Also, previously, she had come to see him on the Brez, so it only seemed fair that for their next meeting, he should be the one making the journey. The thought of entering the EAC's regressive, barbarous realm made his stomach churn, but he set off for the shuttle launch bay. By the time his pilot set the shuttle down outside a castle within the middle lands of B.I., he was feeling no better about the visit. If anything, his distaste for the EAC's mode of living had grown. He stepped down from the shuttle hatch onto a landing pad made from stone. He rolled his eyes. Stone flags were clearly preferable to plain concrete, according to EAC mentality. Lorcan looked around. The pad had been constructed in the grounds of an ancient castle set on the high ground in the surrounding landscape. A fresh breeze was blowing in from the ocean and the midday sun stood overhead. A road passed near the edge of the grounds in the distance, but, as to be expected, it was empty of traffic. He knew that, if he inspected it more closely, he would find potholes and cracks filled with grass and weeds. Such were the ways of the EAC. In certain parts of the Dweer's realm were the usual manufacturing plants and offices. While she waged her wars, they were unavoidable. But all knew these were stopgap measures until she achieved her aims. He would be glad to leave Earth to the cult. He would certainly not want to live in the world it was intent on creating. Ua Talman, said a man, as he appeared at the castle gate. Welcome. If you would come with me, I will take you to the Dweer. Wordlessly, Lorcan followed him. The man looked and behaved like a servant. I think of the EAC as a group of individuals, but really... It is one person, Dweer Kala Or. She is the driving force. She would never accept the title, but she's actually a queen. He was led through the gate into the open arched castle doorway. 
They climbed stone stairs, each tread worn at the centre edge by the passage of feet over thousands of years. Tapestries hung on every wall of the large chamber they entered, and colour ore sat in the middle on a seat of carved wood dark with age. The floor was wooden also, and heavily varnished and polished. Furniture made hundreds of years ago lined the edges of the room. Sofas padded with hand-embroidered upholstery, cabinets, display cases holding hideous, moth-eaten, stuffed animals and ancient books. Even the smell of the place was old. It smelled musky and dank, as if the castle hadn't encountered sunlight or fresh air in centuries. Lorcan felt like he was inside a history docuvid. The woman herself completed the picture, Whereas aboard the Brez, the Dwyer had appeared entirely out of place, here she was the perfect complement to the scene. Her deep blue velvet gown hung to the floor, where embroidered cloth slippers peeked from beneath the hem. The sleeves also hung low, though the upper sections were cut to just below her wrists, revealing her small pale hands. She wasn't wearing her headdress, and her hair had been elaborately plaited and coiled, with jewel-tipped pins holding it in place. He was pleased to see that this time she didn't appear intent on revealing excessive flesh. Ua Talman, thank you for agreeing to my request. It's my pleasure, but call me Lorcan, if it isn't too presumptuous of me to assume we remain on first-name terms. The Dwyer waved the servant away. When the man had left, she said, Not presumptuous at all. Despite her words, Lorcan got the impression she thought she was allowing him a large, potentially unwarranted concession. Dwyer Orr on her home turf was a different animal from the woman who had come to his colony ship to seek an alliance. Please be seated, Lorcan. Can I offer you some refreshment? Champagne, perhaps? Had he seen the shadow of a wink? He took the gilded stool that was the only other single seat in the room and moved it close to her before sitting down. Refreshment won't be necessary, thank you. While it's delightful to visit you at home, Carla, I am afraid I can only stay a short time. I am a very busy man. Starships to build and all that... Shall we get down to business? We must decide our next manoeuvre regarding the BA, yes. The battle for the Caribbean islands is going well, but I have another purpose in asking you here, which I would like to discuss first, before we move on to more important matters. Hmm, what is it? By all means, let's get it out of the way. Well, he should be along any minute. He... Lorcan was not prepared to accept a third party into the APEAC pact, if that was her intention, and definitely not someone Carla had unilaterally enlisted. He was about to say so when the door handle squeaked as it turned and the door opened. A boy aged around nine or ten walked in. He was dark-haired and pale-skinned like his mother. His large, dark eyes were like pools of black water. Perrin, come here. Come and meet Ua Talman. The boy ran to Carla's side and rested a hand on the arm of her chair, regarding Lorcan shyly, or was it slyly? I would like to introduce my son. Though he was careful not to show it, Lorcan was speechless with outrage. What was the woman thinking? Why would she think he was remotely interested in her family? Did she believe he was paying a social call? Perrin is fascinated by your project, said Carla. Then, turning to the boy, she added, Aren't you? He's been reading all about it. Yes, but one thing I don't understand, piped Perrin. Could you tell me why it's called the Antarctic Project when it's in space? It's, uh... Lorcan's mind was working overtime. His rage at being subjected to this domestic nonsense was proving hard to overcome. 
Yet he didn't want to say anything that would jeopardise the delicate alliance between him and the Dwyer. He purposefully unclenched his jaw. The company my wife and I set up had its beginnings in mines in Antarctica, thus our choice of name. The colonisation project sprang from the company and I retained the name in memory of her. Oh, is she dead? He glared at the boy. Yes, she died. Perrin, don't be insensitive. I apologise on behalf of my son. He's too young to understand these things. Lorcan was not so sure. This was your additional reason for inviting me to your castle. I'm pleased to meet your boy, but now the introductions are over, perhaps we can move on to more urgent matters. I wasn't quite finished, said Carla. Perrin would love to see the project at first hand, and it would be very educational for him. I was wondering if it might be possible for him to visit your ship, the Brez. He would be accompanied by a guardian, of course. Out of the question, blurted Lorcan. I'm sorry, he went on in a milder tone, but my ship is neither a tourist attraction nor an educational facility. Many areas are unsafe and I cannot spare any staff to give guided tours. Was the woman mad? She was regarding him calmly as if she were making the most reasonable request in the world. He would be content with only visiting the finished parts and he wouldn't bother anyone. Simply to see the ship would be enough. Lorcan ground his teeth. Tense moments passed and then he leapt up, knocking over his stool. Dreer Orr, I am a man of great patience, but you have exhausted it. Your request is preposterous. It's offensive and unconscionable. You seem to think I'm running some kind of tourist attraction or, or daycare facility. No, your boy cannot visit my ship. Not today, not tomorrow, not ever. Now, we have urgent business to discuss. Are you willing to talk now or are we to sever our partnership and go our separate ways? I can assure you both options are equally attractive to me at the moment. Carla also rose to her feet, calmly and deliberately. She walked up to Lorcan, drawing so close he could see fine threads of red in the whites of her eyes. He thought she might try to strike him, but she only said, Please calm down. It was only a question. I am perfectly calm, he yelled. And if I'm not, whose fault is that? You drag me down here to your barbaric wilderness, populated by drooling fools, bewitched by cultish rituals and fantasies, and expect me to indulge your child's whims and fancies. Who do you think you are? Who do you think I am? The Dweer's lips thinned and her eyes blazed. Ua Talman, you are in my domain. Watch your speech. I do not take insults lightly. What are you going to do? Throw me from the castle battlements? Chain me up in a dungeon? Send me to your chief torturer? Your culture is a blight on the planet, an anachronism, an affront to human civilization, and I shall be glad to leave you and your kind far behind. He was beyond caring about diplomacy with the deluded woman. She was a throwback to a brutal age, eschewing the very technology that had lifted humanity from the swamps of its brutal animal past. He fully expected her to send for thugs to seize him. If she did, he would con the leader of his military forces. His military would rescue him and then retribution would rain down on the EAC. But the Dweer didn't call for guards. She laughed. She chuckled, holding a delicate hand over her mouth. The boy, Perrin, watched his mother sharing in her amusement. When she had her mirth under control, she said, Is that really how you see us? I suppose it's to be expected. 
At first glance, we must seem quite primitive, and I suppose our style echoes that of earlier ages. But how can you forget about our military aircraft, ships, and starships, our infantry? Do you think we could have helped to attack the Caribbean islands with only swords and spears? Haven't you watched the EAC's progress across the globe? No, but, but, she had taken the wind from his sails. He felt outmaneuvered. I assumed your forces were only a stopgap measure, a necessary evil until. Please sit, Uratalman, and I will explain. He picked up the overturned stool and sat down. You are a man of science, am I correct? Before he could answer, she continued, "Why am I even asking? Of course you are. How else would you be able to travel to the stars? Scientific discoveries are what have made the project possible. Science has brought you everything you desire. It wouldn't be an exaggeration to say you worship it like a god." Actually, that would be a great exaggeration," said Lorcan tersely. Ignoring him, the dwyer went on, "What if I were to tell you there is another layer to the universe, and that science has not even brushed its surface, a dimension that lies beyond the parameters of everyday experience and rational thought? What are you talking about? Multiple universes, quantum mechanics?" Perhaps quantum mechanics is a part of the explanation for the phenomena. I mean, yes, perhaps the strange behaviour of quantum particles has something to do with it. But the things I have observed and experienced are on a macro scale, forces that don't exist in any physics textbook, impossible connections, events that are beyond reason. The EAC is not moving backward, Lorcan. It is moving forward. What you see around you isn't a rejection of technology; it is the acceptance of a new truth, a better way. For example, you look at my home and see a relic of the past, don't you? But ideas of the past, the present, and the future are observational fallacies. Time is not a ribbon we travel along. If you were to read ancient history, you would see that at one point humans were moving toward this deeper understanding of the universe, but they chose science instead. Don't mistake me; that discipline has its value, but it is far from everything. There is so much more to know. And the EAC is involved in the exploration of those unknown areas of our understanding. You may one day stand upon an alien planet, Uatalman, but you never know. I may already be there to greet you. But, but, he rubbed his forehead. The woman was clearly insane. He decided it would be better to humour, not antagonise her. The EAC was useful to him, at least until the BA were finally defeated and he could take the remainder of the resources he needed. Two long trips to Earth in succession had exhausted him, and he had plenty to do back on the Brez. He needed to cut to the chase, agree their next step, and return to his ship. Dwyer, or I'll think on what you've told me. Now, how about this? Your boy can visit the Brez for a few days, providing he doesn't get in anyone's way. Thank you. He won't be any trouble, I assure you. Perrin is very mature for his age. Now that's settled, can we please discuss our ongoing strategy? Chapter Twenty-Two. Hans, so glad you could make it. I bet. The former deputy prime minister, who had stepped into his deceased superior's shoes, stared coldly at Hans from the far side of the conference table. Bone thin, sparse grey hair clinging to his scalp, and bespectacled, though surgery to correct eye defects was cheap and common, the new PM was an establishment archetype. 
and he hated hands. The man was, naturally, careful to never express his opinion openly. Only in the late evenings, when the select few of the inner government circle would meet for nightcaps and cigars at an exclusive club, would Beaumont Smith give vent to his true feelings about the head of SIS. Jumped up immigrant and the kind of man who buys his own furniture were two phrases waiting staff had overheard and passed on to Hans's contact. No matter that it was Hans's great-great-grandparents who were the immigrants. To someone like Beaumont Smith, if you couldn't trace your family back to one of William the Conqueror's companions, you were scum. The cabinet ministers and military leaders sitting around the conference table had the decency to look embarrassed. Hans had a feeling most of them were unaware he hadn't been informed about the emergency meeting. If he hadn't shown up, Beaumont Smith and his cronies would have insinuated he must have been too ill to attend, casting doubt on his fitness for the role, or even implied he must have forgotten or decided not to come. My pleasure, Prime Minister, he replied, and may I take the opportunity to congratulate you on your new position, despite the sad circumstances that led to your appointment. Sad circumstances indeed, said Beaumont Smith. I would that it had been any other way. I'm sure you do, said Hans, noticing no empty seats at the table. One of the PM's aides simultaneously realised the faux pas and leapt to her feet. Please take my seat, Mr Jonter. Mustering as much dignity as he could, he strode around the table to the woman's chair, which sat next to the Prime Minister, while the aide left to find a replacement. As he sat down, he tried to maintain a confident, capable facade. Lying in hospital, he'd felt reasonably healthy, but after leaving it, he'd soon realised he was far from recovered. Withdrawing the treatment for his damaged lungs had made walking more than a few paces extremely fatiguing, as if he were climbing a mountain. As the men and women sitting around the table watched him, he also became painfully aware of his singed beard and hair, inflamed skin, cuts and bruises. He smiled easily and picked up a copy of the agenda that lay on the table. He couldn't afford to appear weak. The meeting had only just started, and the first point to be discussed was the one that interested him the most. I'm sure Mr Jonter requires no introduction to anyone present, said Beaumont Smith. So we'll proceed to item one without any further ado? The chair nodded. The PM cleared his throat. As we all know, Her Majesty Queen Alice's funeral will take place this coming Sunday. All arrangements are in place. The proposal we must discuss today is the date of His Majesty King Frederick's current Prime Minister, interjected the Chief of Defence Staff, a man called Hennessy. I'm sure I'm not speaking only for myself when I say that time is pressing. I should be working on military strategy, not stuck here discussing matters of pomp and ceremony. I'd like to propose we reorder the agenda so we can get to the important topics first and I and my military colleagues can depart and leave you to decide what day Freddy gets his crown. I see, said Beaumont Smith, trying but failing to disguise his displeasure. Well, we could put it to the vote, I suppose, said the chair. Hennessy gave a loud, audible sigh. Which items would you prefer to discuss first? asked the Prime Minister, looking at Hennessy over the rims of his glasses. The report on the attack on the General Council, the Chief answered, in the tone of someone explaining something to a toddler, and the plan for dealing with the new alliance between the AP and EAC. Does anyone second this motion? the Chair asked. Seconded, said Montague the first Sea Lord and Chief of Naval Staff. Who says I? Please raise your hand. Hans lifted his hand, along with most of those present. Motion carried. A muscle twitched in the PM's jaw. 
Very well, he said. If everyone would please turn to documents 15 and 16. I hope you've all had the opportunity to read your copies. Hans located the relevant papers and began to hastily scan them. His department had helped to carry out the investigation while he'd been incapacitated, but no one had sent him the completed reports, another of Beaumont Smith's omissions. The reports could be embarrassing, and he knew he had to tread carefully to avoid being blamed. If anyone should have known about the plan of the attack on the General Council, it was Sis. Yet his staff had been entirely in the dark. He was relieved to see the report somewhat exonerated his department. He saw something interesting and read it more closely. Hundreds of man-hours spent trawling satellite data had revealed a small private shuttle had departed from within EAC territory and travelled to one of the AP's colony ships, Brez, three days prior to the attack. The preliminary conclusion of the main report was that the AP-EAC alliance had been forged less than two weeks ago and the assault on Barbados had been an operation rapidly engineered by the two organisations. The fast pace of action meant that by the time CIS double agents had learned of the plan, it was too late to warn the General Council. CIS was already at work finding out what the Allies were planning next. The report isn't bad as far as it goes, said Beaumont Smith, but there's a glaring omission. What I'd like to know is... How the hell did the AP and EAC know the time and place of the General Council meeting? I mean, don't we have any security to prevent the leaking of such sensitive information? He glared at Hans. Hundreds of people were invited to that meeting, Hans retorted, against my advice, if you remember. If certain individuals hadn't been intent on turning the whole thing into a propaganda exercise, taking advantage of the Queen's attendance to bolster flagging confidence in the government, far fewer attendees would have been present and the chances of a leak would have been considerably reduced. I refuse to be held responsible for the wagging tongues of every media rep and business mogul. Those people were notified at the last minute, the PM retaliated. They couldn't possibly have... We already know the attack was mounted at lightning speed, said Hennessy. Is there any point in trying to assign... So you're saying it must have been someone who knew the details weeks before the meeting who passed them on to the EAC or AP? asked Hans. That would narrow the field to CIS and the people in this room. My staff are thoroughly vetted and completely trustworthy. He let the implication of his words hang in the air. Now look here! Beaumont Smith spluttered. If you're suggesting anyone here would knowingly put Her Majesty's life in danger, for goodness sake, exclaimed one of the cabinet ministers. More people died than the flipping Queen, you know. Good people, with families and loved ones. Her Majesty's death was tragic, but let's not lose focus. Exactly, Hennessy said. Focus is what's needed here. We suffered a catastrophe in the Caribbean, and I don't want to be pessimistic, but things aren't looking good for us going forward. I think that, regardless of where the fault lies, we have to agree. No more General Council meetings until this war is over. Circumventing the democratic process should be a last resort, said the PM. It's admitting defeat before... Admitting defeat for you, you mean, said Montague. Perhaps a vote of no confidence is in order. That's entirely unnecessary. Beaumont Smith was pink with fury. And the thin end of the wedge. Postponing council meetings is the first step on the road to martial law. That's what you want, isn't it? Hennessy leapt to his feet. That's an outrageous accusation. The PM also stood. He rested his hands on the table and leaned over it, saying... This government will not give in to bullying. Any more pressure to hamper the council's due process will be viewed as a traitorous act. I'm not staying here to be threatened and insulted, yelled Hennessy. The military leaders will hold a separate meeting where we will decide the Britannic Alliance's next moves. 
When we come to a decision, we will inform Parliament. Officers, if you would come with me, he marched to the exit. Montague quickly followed, and after some dithering, so did all the military attendees. In the silence that followed their departure, the ministers appeared shocked and dismayed, and Beaumont Smith seemed about to explode with impotent rage. Hans sat quietly twiddling his thumbs. His long years of sowing mistrust and suspicion through the BA's higher echelons of power were paying off. A schism between military and government had appeared. Most importantly, King Frederick's coronation, the thing he most wanted to prevent from happening, hadn't even been discussed. The fracturing and strife were unfortunate, but only to be expected, and the final outcome would be worth it. Now all Hans had to do was to pick his moment. Ministers, he said, I'd like to propose that I join our military leaders' meeting. I don't think they'll object, and it would be helpful to have a governmental presence at their discussions. No one objected, so he left. His painful lungs and injuries still bothered him, but his mood was high. From among the ashes of the ancient, failing monarchy, a new republic would arise, a shining light to lead humanity into the future. The End This has been The Valiant, Star Legend Book One, written and narrated by J.J. Green with help from Welsh language consultant Mike Paddock. For more JJ Green books, visit jjgreenauthor.com.